And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my two good brothers in this in this journey through the through the land of the leveled up. We have the man of the man of a thousand mechs and the and the and the man who could who could pro who could probably des who could probably describe Thaco in the space in the space of a tweet. Good brother Ash, and we have. The, and we have the man of a thousand runes and the bane of my fucking existence, Good Brother Zana. We um we are one week late, so we are so we are all pulling a Doku cosplay this week. Except Doku's cosplaying himself even harder. I like to cons I like to consider it as Doku being the equivalent of um whatever character Elvis was playing in an Elvis movie. <laughs> Um, but this week we ta we are tackling we are tackling another class, and this t this time being the wizard. And to the sh much to the chagrin of um of Rincewind, that is wizard with only one Z, not um sixteen of them. Because. And also, Which means that this wizard is so bad. <laughs> although that, although I'd like, I'd like to retort that that's that's big talk from somebody who can't cast ma who can't um, cast magic, because every spell in existence is afraid of the one in his head. <laughs> but. When it comes now, of course, with the wizard, this this is one of the this is one of the big fours. And while we've tackled a casting class in the past, this will be uh, this will be our opportunity to dive right in when it comes to the way the casting system is as dealt with in the past. Now, for the purposes of kindness, I am putting aside my issues with the Va with the Vancian model itself, um, because that that's be that's beyond the scope of this. Is it? Spell points Is for the it? win. You can't convince me otherwise. Don't be a... Sm Ash, don't be a smart ass. I can't... All parts of me are smart. I can't hardly isolate them, but... There's nothing... There's simply nothing I can do about it. Now... Man, he would be great with the Akiba Rangers, wouldn't he, Monk? Yes. <laughs> 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 Uh, now, going all going all the way back at the class that we know as the wizard was originally called the magic user, right around the time that the fighter was called the fighting man. Um, it is complete. It, I th I thank the heavens above that those names didn't stick. <laughs> but they're very orcish names. They f they serve function. That's all you need. Um, and of course. But of course, even back then, the the wizard was the was the squishy boy, having a measly D four in hit die. Even the elf and the halfling had D sixes back then. Back when you got your health from some place that was arbitrarily decided. <laughs> Apparently, elf and halfling are also you know. Professions? <laughs> yeah, I um was never a fan of the whole ra the whole races class thing. Um, which means we at least have to give some credit where credits due for later versions of D and D when they implemented both race and class, mm -hmm. both with their own sets of modifiers. Yeah. And of co of course. Once you, much like with a lot of, much like with a lot of um, classes back then, once you reached ninth level, you became a named character, so you could either create your own tower or maybe a dungeon, and to your own territory, getting apprentice wizards, or can be an employ, or can be an employed mage. Um, we of course, we of course had this, of course, gave us the introduction to the rules when it came to um, spell books. 
Um, the DM's guide had rules for making humanoid magic users, i.e., i.e., ma i.e., um, magic users that are that aren't player characters. Um, although, and in some cases, an alternative. They were originally called Wicca, but were but were renamed for um, IRL reasons. <laughs> um. For the reasons of offended of offended people everywhere, because the offended people get offended and things change. Um, Hollow World had them rebranded as the Wokani in its player's guide, and that carried over to the rules cyclopedia. Um, it would then th that particular approach would then be reflavored as the Witch Doctor. Um, I'm and surprised that one hasn't been attacked yet. Um. And that and um it would and it would develop a little bit a little bit fur a little bit further what with what with giving details how their spell casting consists of quote dancing waving strange items shouting and howling because that doesn't sound like someone hopped up on drugs at all <laughs> um but then we when we get to AD and D first edition. There's not a whole, there's not a whole lot of difference on the surface except for except for two key things. One, from 11th level onwards, they could create their own enchanted items and scrolls. Two, territory founding wasn't until 12th level. Um the il the el they also br this and of course with a with a lot of with a lot of these stuff in AD&D, they started experimenting with the whole kit idea. Um, the illusionist couldn't couldn't cast standard magic user spells, and in, and instead had a specific pool of spells which magic users couldn't learn themselves. Um, this is how we first got spells like prismatic spray, boo, and phantasmal killer, yay. <laughs> um, prismatic spray, the spell of the month of June. Yep. Um. Unearthed Arcana back in first edition is where we first got the idea of cantrips, which um, I'd say I'd say up until up until fifth edition, cantrips have been um, moderately use moderately useful in very certain circumstances, but otherwise otherwise not so much. Um. Whereas they started to become, they started to become basically the at wills for wizards when fifth edition came in. Um, second edition, wizards were king of everything. <laughs> Third edition, wizards were only behind Godzilla. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and yeah, they there were there were a shit there were a shit ton of kits for. Um, for the wizard in se in second edition, and this another thing to note is that second edition is where the idea of magic schools was introduced, evocation, summoning, enchantment, those all those kind of things. There have been some there have been some si some side schools that have popped that have popped up here and then over the years, but they've never stuck. It's always it's always been that ba that basic um that basic setup. Um. Usually, with usually with the inbuilt assumption that most wizards are going to be generalists. Which edition was this? Well, that it, that that intro that introduced um introduced spell um spell schools. Um, AD and D second. Ah. Wait, AD and D second assumed that they were going to be uh, generalists. There's been. When they when they introduced the spell schools, there was there was kind of, it's it's not outright stated, but there's an inbuilt assumption that unless uh, unless declared other otherwise through a kit or something like that, most um most wizards are going to be generalists, not necessarily focusing in one particular school. With within that specific game, as I, as I recall. Interesting. Oh. Sorry, I was just saying that that brought up a note. I might bring that up later once we get to things like wizard archetypes and uh, 
schools, if you will. Yeah. But the thing, the thing with the thing with the the thing with the um, kits is that in so, you know how you know how we've talked about um about some about how some classes ended up becoming too useful. That kind of shows that kind of showed up in AD and D second because the right kit and a little bit of multi-classing could um could could really boost could really boost up a wizard's already considerable power like say the undead master kit which which a lot which could give which um could allow somebody to use necromancy and enchantment spells and could command undead like in like an evil cleric of equal level and the ability to command outsiders as if they were undead of an equivalent hit die. Um, of course, a uh, that doesn't sound overpowered at all. Um, a f a properly done fighter mage gish around this time could be rid could be um. It would it would certainly be a slow advancement, but it could but it could still be um it could still be po it could still be potent. We're at. Whereas a um, fighter who then dual, cl if whereas a fighter who then du dual class two wizard would start with a beefier bit of hit, hit points. I consider this the first. I consider this one of the first instances of um, di of class dipping. Um. Of course, then third edition decided to make decided to make things, even um, even more even more powerful. And yes, Ka Godzilla is cer is certainly a f is certainly a force to be reckoned with. But um, third edition is where we first got meta magic in the form of the in the form of feats, and because and because of that, we started to drift a little bit away from the fire and forget rule with the Vancian model. Um. And at the at the now what I know I've I know I've said that can, I know I said that cantrips weren't much to write home about, but in the past cantrips were worse because it wasn't until third edition that the idea of cantrips always being level zero was um was uh, was in the cards. Um, cantrips cantrips earlier early on they were first level spells, and. You're not going to get a and first and of course, at low levels those sl those spell slots are in very short supply. <laughs> um, the yeah, you were able to specifically you were able to as sort of an option, I believe at the very least an OD and D. Like you could say, all right, instead of taking shield or whatever, I'm going to say for my apprenticeship, I remember uh, cool food or drink. Or gust, whatever it might be, and you would be like you would be taking that instead of sleep. Which, if your magic user doesn't take sleep in AD and D, you should punch them. Oh, it's it's important to it's important to remember as well that the further that the further back you go, the the the, the less you see the idea of of um, learning spells automatically by levels. You actually have to go out and you actually have to go out and find spells, and some and sometimes that means being at the mercy of the GM's loot table. <clears throat> um, I'm not saying that's a I'm not saying that going out and finding spells is a good is a good or bad idea. It's just a thing that kind of got phased out. Um, when pa Pathfinder didn't change the didn't change too much when it comes to the wizards, the big change. Is the idea of of um, opposition schools, i.e., you'd f i.e. there'd be one per one particular um, one particular school that you'd be good at, and one particular school that you'd be bad at, and the one that you're bad at costs two spell slots. Whereas in the past, opposition schools were um, prohibited. That i.e., if if um, if you took one school, you couldn't take certain other schools. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And even then, it was only if you specialized in that school. Yeah. Because a generalist could still touch all schools. Um, cantrips were but were made to be at will spells instead instead of instead of ones that were per, that were per days. Um, but some of the some of these strongest spells did get a bit of nerf. Um, 
but not a, but not all that many. These the ones that um the ones that ended up getting nerfed were things like Grease, Glitter Dust, Ray of Enf Ray, Ray of Enfeeblement, and Polymorph. The game breaking shit, you know, things like fucking Wish or Charm slash Dominate Person weren't touched. So it does. So even though some of the low level spells got nerfed, they in the grand scheme of things, they didn't even nerf low level wizards. Let let's. <laughs> Let's be fair, though. Normally, a low-level wizard isn't going to encounter Wish unless it's on a magic item. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and even then, a DM can still say that there's additional costs if they choose to. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't want to delve too deep into it, but but um, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring out Spheres of Power because I'm going to be talking about that a little a little ways down the line in a separate project. Um. But that, but in that one, the wizard is less is less abs is less absurd, largely because of the fact that you don't just have a huge list of spells that you pick from, but you're picking talents. Um, Spheres of Power is a very interesting system, and like I said, I'm pr I'm I'm hoping to delve into that in the future. Um, fourth edition, depending on who you ask, they either com they either. They either made wizards make sense, or they completely killed them because they were not they were not as much the. At first glance, a lot of people saw that they weren't the do everything, people, especially since a lot of the a lot of the more utilitarian spells were made into, um, rituals, which some people didn't ca care for because that because all that you needed in order to be able to learn rituals is one feat, so. Te so technically, anybody could learn things like Magic Mouth or Arcane Lock. It's just that Wizards got the feat for free and could learn more rituals than anybody else. Um, and of, but they, but um, they did, they did maintain a spell book in Fourth Edition. Um, and it it mainly had to do with. Instead, instead of the typical approach, it was that whenever a wizard would get a utility or daily power, they got to learn two. Um, but they had, but they had to, but the amount, the amount of ones that they could actually bring to bear was the same, was the same as everybody else. They just had, they just had a bit more of a, a bit more potential variety. Um, this is also where we started to see specializations regarding the, imp regarding the um, implement. So in, so instead of instead of it just being a static modifier depend depending on how on whether or not you're using an orb a staff or a or a wand or a tome now it actually has some um some mechanical weight um there's a, there's been a meme for a while that fourth edition wizards are just evokers they do have a lot of blasting spells but that's not exactly accurate um and tr and tr and truth be to truth be told um there's a good amount of variety of of all type of all types within the um power list that the wizard had not to mention the fact that it was always really easy to turn a wizard into a blaster caster it didn't take a lot of work well, even even back in the day, wizards were even back. I think even back in the in the original chainmail, wizards were basically the art, the artillery archetype. Yeah, your purpose was to cast either either you were going to cast fireball or lightning bolt, or you were going to summon an elemental, and hope that nothing went wrong. Um, is it dickish of me that in some of my early games, I actually I actually had I when somebody was casting say fireball, I actually had them roll for scatter. I wouldn't say so. <laughs> so you bust out the dowel, you roll a d6, you say, all right, a two, you, you mark, you have your one-inch increments that determine whether or not the, uh, exactly where the thing is going to go. If you have a, nowadays, if you have a, a more, if you have a faster means of doing that, I think that that can, that can work within a game. And it certainly belongs in a war, war game. So no, I don't think you're a dick for doing that. Some people didn't be. I think because they were used to the fire and the whole fire and forget thing. Um, 
where or the idea or the idea that it that it was all that it was always that it was always going to hit going to hit its in, hit the intended spot um but i look at that as a as suggestions you know like pants there's a reason that I always aimed my fireballs at a five foot square instead of anywhere else. DC five is easy to hit. <clears throat> now, with fit, with fifth edition, we still have the whole spells and we still have the whole thing with spell books. Um, cantrips are are still are still cast at will, but. In, but um, the whole "you forget your spells after you cast them" had been thrown out the window, <laughs> which that was the that was the subject of that was the subject of a, of a fair f of a fair few jokes, and that's the and um, the color of magic was was um Terry Pratchett basically taking the piss out of Jack Vance's whole whole, whole spell memorizing thing. Um. And, but it was it. But um. But the other the other key, the other key thing is the fact that a wizard who did not have his spell book didn't didn't become completely useless, <laughs> which it which is something that could happen in earlier editions. Yep, because without the spell book, you can't look at you the spells you've written down and thus can't rememorize them. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also the fact that. One thing, one thing that was dropped from from the jump between three to five is the is the difference between spells per is the whole spells per day and spells known thing. Um. So I think I think now it's just a case of you get a you get a set number you get a set number of spell spells that you learn every level up. Um. I think they so. As as I understood it in fifth. You could basically switch out the spells that you knew at every level up as well. Yeah, for for, for what? For a wizard or for a? We're focusing on we're focusing on wizard this week. Remember? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the reason I ask is because it actually works differently for different casters, and for the wizard in particular, the spells that you do put in your spell book are the spells that remain. That is not something that you can swap out. In fact, that might be unique to the when it comes to like spells known casters. That might be unique to the wizard, actually, because you can swap out those spells for the ranger, and you can swap out those spells for the sorcerer. It more or less it. Um, I think I think that's to as to address the whole the whole the whole um issue that ha that happened with um with it in order to. Because um, in the pa in the past, the whole spontaneous casting thing didn't ha didn't have as much of an impact as or as originally oh. hoped. But that br but take but taking all that into account, that brings us to the to the level up version. Um, and hang and. Hang on a second, because one of because one of my tabs has decided to take its sweet time lo loading what I needed, since <laughs> I since I accidentally hit the X. But <clears throat> now what? Now um, I th I don't. Th oh come on! Don't do this to me, man. Technical difficulties. Yeah. They happen everywhere. Yeah, it's the it's the problem with it's the problem with one with one of the sites that I use as as a, as a reference deciding to derp. Um if it's the one I think you're you're trying to go to, uh, it's currently five oh three. Um <laughs> It's not necessarily that one. It's a di it's a different one that I'm u that I'm using. I mainly use I mainly use it as a reference for when we do the um, subclass hour. <clears throat> so I just so I just have to load that. 
load that particular thing up. Um, that be that being sa that being said. Um, looks like I have to do this. The, looks like I have to do this the old-fashioned way. But it's good. It's always important. It's always important to have a backup because what I'm, what I really want to, what I really need to look at is if if there's a um, if there's a rate difference when it comes to when it comes to spells. Um, as far. So let me see here. Three, two. And already, already there. Let's see. Two, three, four, two. I don't. When it comes to this, when it comes to the spell slots, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like that changes all that much. Um. Let's. And although um, what is interesting is signature spells happens a lot earlier. Signature spell was a, it in core is the cap is the um capstone, whereas you're get whereas you're getting signature spells here at fifth level, but with that in mind, we, let's let's jump into this class. Yeah. Um. So when it. When it comes to when it comes to cantrips and spellbook, I think it it looks like it's more or less the same. Um. You know, with when it comes to cantrips, um, spellbook, preparing and casting spells, spell casting ability, ritual casting, um, spell casting focus, learning spells of first level and first level and higher. Actually, let me check that because it's in this case it's. Two, it's two new spells each level, and yep, same, same approach. Um, yeah, nothing. The only addition is that at first level you automatically know the precedition, precedigitation cantrip, which I uh, do like quite a bit. I, I really like the idea that hey, this is your. It, this I like anything that says something in particular about the spellcaster and and reinforces the archetype, which is why I love Vancey and Magic, by the way. But yeah, that's I I think that's a nice little touch. Your love of Vancey and Magic is allowed. This is a country where you're allowed to be wrong, after all. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna stick with I'm gonna stick with Mr. Vance over. I don't even. I, what else would you even pick? Sanderson. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had an I had an answer right for you, and it's Anderson. Well, this, is a, this is a country in which we're allowed to be wrong. So, yes, I know that's why you're wrong here. <laughs> no, I will. I will continue to maintain the the glory of boys rails. <laughs> this, is, this is on rails because we are going to get into it. Later. And it I uh, I <laughs> let's and, just continue anyway. Um, let's see when it comes to. When it comes to arcane recovery, which you also get at also get at um first level, um, it it is it is more it is more or less the same and um because of because of how it's set up, I I am one I am once again not fond of the fa of the fact that so, that something like this is. Has the has the double dip of you can only do this once per day and you can and when you finish a short rest and you know all the other restrictions such as you can only restore a number of slots equal to <clears throat> uh, ha that is equal to half of your level rounded up mm -hmm. and none of the slots can be sixth level or higher. I don't mind. I don't mind the idea of arcane recovery. I just think that there's way too many asterisks. Yeah, it, it's it's got too many uh, qualifiers. I don't know. It's it's very useful the higher level that you get. 
until you, and, you know, at a level where you <laughs> want to spend some of your spell slots to get other spell slots. Let's see. Um, not too much to talk about when it comes to Arcane Tradition, because that's basically the subclass, so save that for later. Um, same uh, with exploration next and ASI. We're ski we're um, skimming past that for now, simply because that. Well, ASI is ASI. ASI is ASI, ASI yeah. and when it comes we'll to on to signature spells, yeah, which is the, is one of the more significant changes because signature spell originally was the capstone. Yes. <laughs> And in this, and so ori so originally you picked th two third level wizard spells as your signature spells, which you always have prepared. They don't count against the number of spells you have prepared, and you can cast each of them once at third level without expending a spell slot. Once you do so, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. Um, whereas with this one. So you choose one first level wizard spell that's in your spell book. You can cast this spell at its, low, at its lowest level without expending a spell slot when you have it prepared. If you want to cast it as a higher level, you must expend a slot as normal. Once you've cast a signature spell in this way, you must finish a shorter long rest to do it again. By spending 8 hours in study, you can exchange the spell you chose as your signature for a different spell of the same level. As you gain as you gain levels in this class, you can have more signature spells, and they can increase in power. Um, so something we should note just before anybody uh, gets gets themselves in a bunch, uh, we are aware that this actually operates as the 18th level wizard ability rather than as the sig spell mastery is the 18th level wizard ability mm -hmm. for fifth edition, and that's functionally how this works. Uh, everything that we say here is still going to apply insofar as you get this new thing at 5th level and all of our comments on that are not going to be in any way nullified by the fact that, hey, this works like Spell Mastery does mm -hmm. and not signature spells in 5th edition. We, that, that was a derp, that was a derp on my part. Um, no, no, that's that's not a derp on your part at all. This, this is just a this is just a in advance like, hey, we know that the name, we know that the name is identical to this other thing that you get at twentieth level, and the mechanics are identical to this thing you get at eighteenth level. Uh, all of our commentary is going to go forth basically unchanged. Mm -hmm. It looks like this one um, goes up to seventeenth as well, fifth, ninth, uh, then thir It would assume another four to thirteenth, and another four from there to seventeenth. Um, Could be. They might I want to get, say they might I, not want to scale it in that fashion, but I get I get the feeling that um, that the t that the higher end of those four you're g is where you're going to have the ability to have two signature spells, um, and along with the possibility of it go of it going um, of it going at higher le of it going at um, higher spell slot levels. I'm pretty sure that. If it goes up in the progression I'm thinking, you'll get two signature spells at 13th, but it'll still be first or second. And then you'll get third at 17th level. Mm -hmm. now, it's entirely possible. Yeah. Now, at 7th, at there is... At 7th is, um, is, spe is spell study... Do we do we want to dip into the signature spell thing for a little bit there? I, like, uh... yeah, it's, um, with my, I don't know about you, but I'd probably I'd probably highlight I'd probably highlight this in in um in yellow. It well how, how good that how good this version is going to be is going to ultimately depend on how the higher end of the, of this goes. Interesting. But, but I don't. But I don't mind the fact that this is that this is being learned this early. I marked it in blue for that particular reason. Uh, the fact that you're able to swap out your signature spells, you're able to. You're getting this at fifth level, so this is like way. Insofar as fifth edition is concerned, where you only ever play up to at most twelfth level by and large. The fact that you're getting this at fifth level means that it's one part of the actual. It's part of your actual character and 
consider that part of your actual play space. And it just makes you better at casting. It makes you the penultimate it makes you the penultimate spellcaster and saying like, hey, I have I now have by the time I get to fifth level, I now have two features which just straight up make me able to access more spell slots and cast more spells on a given day of higher level. Chromatic orb. Chromatic orb is what I would choose for this one. Sure. Now, the reason being, I had a I had a character whose whole thing was he liked lightning and chromatic orb because, um, if you create the chromatic orb within five feet, you can make it look like you're thrusting the orb into somebody's uh, chest, thematically speaking. Oh. Um, so, so yeah, this would literally be as a signature as far as signature spells go. This would literally be his signature spell because he threw chromatic orbs around all the time. They were super useful. Mm-hmm. And now, when it comes to spell study, um, this this is this is definitely one of those um, one of the one of the we're going back we're going back to that well to that well of cho- of choose a, of choose a trick that we've ha- that we've had with some of the previous classes because um, because this was def- this was definitely not at seventh level in. Um, in core, in fact, oh, you basically got nothing like this in core. No, in co- in core, you got you got one more. You got a spell slot at for um fourth level. Um. So these so the um spell studies that we have are arcane objects, which is which which adds identify to your spell book if you didn't have it. Can can do can free can free cast identify once, and can choose two objects when, when using a spell slot and material components. Um, detective spell study. Where, where you can where you can automatically sense presence of active magical effects near you. And you get um. Detect magic and detect thoughts to your spell book if they didn't if you didn't already have them, and get, and their range gets boosted. Um, flora and fauna. Interesting. Yeah. Do you want to go over some of these before we move on to the next one, or um um? Okay, I'm when are we gonna of, dive into these? Do you think? I'm base I'm baselining each of them before we dive into before we dive into any in detail. Alrighty. Um. Then there's fauna and flora. Which is all about all about plants. It says whenever a plant or beast makes a saving throw against a spell that you cast, you can cause the creature to make its saving throw with disadvantage. A num- it, you can do this a number of times equal to your in- to your intelligence modifier, and and regain expended uses when you finish a long rest. And then historian, you gain expertise on history checks, um, for a specific time period. Yeah. You gain the Guidance Cantrip, and it counts as a wizard spell for you. If you cast it on yourself, you use a d6 instead of the normal d4 when applying it to an intelligence check. And when it comes to when it comes to these, I'd say the I was go I was going to I was going to write off Historian because of the expertise die part, but. Because, but um, because of the because of how it modifies guidance, I can, I um, well, I'm a little less inclined to do so. Um, it doesn't mention expertise die. It just gives you advantage on still skill checks with history from a time period. No, it says you gain. I'm looking at I'm looking at it right here. It says you gain an expertise die on history checks. Oh, okay. I did miss that. My chance. My, the, I had to scroll up. <laughs> the top of the banner had covered it. Yeah. Um. My bad. Um. <clears throat> in the end, uh, these are all very mechanically based. Mm-hmm. Um. To me, the ones that have the most flavor are uh, fauna and flora and historian. Only because it's it's dealing with <clears throat> you've studied specific things about how magic interacts with living creatures or with you know living plants. 
or you've done a lot of studying about this specific uh, section of history. There's there's a little bit more of a of not just a mechanical hook in there, but a, a role playing hook as well, a narrative hook. Mm-hmm. And uh, whereas I like the idea of detective spell study, just like oh yeah, I uh, I've been studying how magic feels, so now I can feel magic better. It also makes me think of various detective anime, so I'm just like mm, yes, quite. Honestly, the most boring one to me, although probably one of the most useful, although I don't know how useful it is in 5th ed, is uh, Identify. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure, cast Identify twice. Because uh, uh, that's essentially that second part where it says whenever you cast Identify using a spell slot and material components, you get two o- to, to choose two objects as the target instead of one. It's basically double cast. Um, and you get it for free. There's actually certain campaigns where that comes in. And I know some people in my current campaign who would take that just based on the the number of times we run into situations where it's like, all right, well, we don't, we don't feel like short resting right now, but we also don't feel like spending a spell slot. And do we spend a, do we have time for a, uh, for a 10 minute, like ritual cast and stuff like that? I know some people who might just take that for like, oh, thank God. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it's, it's very functional. But it's not as not interesting, interesting for somebody who yeah who who finds flora and fauna appealing. Yeah, uh, like arcane objects, I would give us I would give a, a solid yellow, mm. like it's functional, but it's not really something like it, it doesn't give me the same the same hooks in all regards that historian or, or flora and fauna do. Especially historian. Historian's one where if you're playing a, 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 a wizard who's been just trapped in his tower for the last 200 years studying some specific thing, and the entire reason he's out and about is because, holy shit, I've connected the dots. There's a eureka moment. There's the meme from It's Always Sunny with the, all, the, all the, the lines and the pins and the papers on the wall. Um... <clears throat> I was going to say know since, it's a, since it's a eureka moment is he go, is he um running out is he running out without putting his clothes on? He's not Einstein, no. <clears throat> what the, Einstein? What are you talking about? I, I'm talking about I'm making a, I ma- no, I'm making a joke about how uh, uh, about an old uh an old Einstein joke about him getting caught naked with someone else and then saying eureka to his wife. Even though I don't think he Old joke. Never mind. It's comic. In any comic. case, I, we might as well switch to the historian now. I I don't think this really displays that. Uh, it does have a little bit more flavor to it, but I would like this to have a social component to it in the way that I'm not sure. Huh. I don't see any of these having a direct social component. Um, I feel like I feel like this one maybe should. Well, his, 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 at, at most, it's got your least favorite type of social component, adding numbers mm-hmm. for, for general check types. Right, and that's sort of my problem, is is think about have... when you're going to bring this information up. You're Daniel Jackson, you're going to... Think about when this information is going to come into play. It's primarily going to be social, right? Because in most cases, it's like, all right, if you meet the DC, your your GM is going to give you this information. The important part, the part that the ability should modify at the very, within the, with understanding the balance of what it is that the level up folks have to work with and the other classes that they've developed and the other abilities that they've developed is when you're going to bring this information to somebody else. Um, So you're going to hit somebody, you know, Daniel Jackson walks up to General Hammond and says, I've translated this dialect of gold it says that we are going to that we could encounter some resistance here but there's some ancient technology that we absolutely need and because it's daniel jackson saying it and this is his area of expertise general hammond basically is is going to concede pretty much immediately except um i'm honestly as far as far as I know that a lot of the classes we've covered have have a social component, but when you consider the wizard arc, when you consider the 
the archetype that th that is that is attempting to be played with. Um, most of the time, most of most of the wizards that D that D and D has portrayed over the years are not exactly what you would call social creatures. Yeah, they're generally very very uh, hermit like. Herm, you we have they we've been working with the stereotype of the wizard up in the tower for years, uh, wrapped up in the study of something. For centuries, <laughs> stories of wizards like that have been around for literal centuries. Yeah. <laughs> So the fact that the fact that spell study isn't necessi isn't um, doesn't have a whole lot doesn't have a whole lot of a so of a social aspect makes perfect sense. Um, it's not spell study in general. It's just in lieu of an interesting feature. Yeah, your historian. And, uh, and to be to be fair, I, if we're if we're going to extend ideas for social hooks. Um, fauna and flora would definitely be one for, you know, there be there could be a social hook for any apothecary or or uh, fur trapper, etc. You know, because you know how magic works with these things. You can talk with them about, oh, have you seen these signs around this area? Maybe there's a magical creature in that area, um, or maybe there's just a creature who has been affected by magic. You know? mm -hmm. there, there's there's a lot of alternatives and social components that could be added to to the two that i, I personally see as it. already has a really cool like expression of it you could force beasts and uh you could force beasts and plants to make saving throws with disadvantage with this feature which is actually really really useful for a wizard yes yes it is that is actually super useful mm -hmm. i'm gonna throw a fireball at you well we're gonna do deck save with disadvantage yeah you are yeah, we're gonna make this. We're gonna make the situation for you like as bad as can possibly be. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. That's why I, I I did outline that one in blue. By the way, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I get I get the feeling fauna and flora is gonna be the one that's the that's the most. I'd say of these, the two that are going to be the most useful are detect our detective spell study and um, fauna and flora. I see them getting the most use, maybe, but I don't know. Yeah, that's what that's what I meant. Yeah, I um, see, I, I see um, because of the niche that Ash pointed out, arcane objects is going to see more use than I would probably have considered at first. Um, I honestly see that unless you're working in a in a rich setting, the that the GM has a history for. Um, one of my friends actually, he has a huge backstory for his his personal setting. Um, historian would fit in perfectly. Any wizard with that with that uh, with that spell study would just thrive in his world, because um, he likes to throw out that sort of fluff and narrative hooks for his first groups. He's mm -hmm. a good buddy. Um, but I think historian is probably going to see about the same use as arcane objects, and we'll see more uses of detective spell study and fauna and flora for different reasons um i i actually like the whole thing though i mean i don't see anything here that to use to use your nomenclature ash i would outline in red um this is mostly this this whole thing looks yellow and up to me <laughs> right i was i was thinking about outlining detective spell study in red only because i find stuff like that intensely annoying uh the like, uh, if you have active magical effects near you, such as a spell effect on an object or a spell effect in an area, you automatically sense its presence. That stuff frustrates me in games like this, where there is no... There's nothing that you have to do to provoke it. I'm okay if you don't even have to spend a resource to provoke it. But a sense in which you might have to provoke it, and you might not have... It might not be on tap literally 24-7... Uh, annoys me. Let's not let's not forget that this is a that it's a that it's an avenue for certain GMs to play the mysterious aura drinking game. Oh boy! <laughs> Considering that you don't know what spells they are, but you can just say, "Yeah, you you sent seventeen auras in this inn." Mm -hmm. All the various magic items. That uh, that does make it that does make for an interesting point. It's like ah yes, you of course you. 
sense magic because you guys are wearing 60 magic items. Uh, <laughs> so the, let, I, the, maybe this has a bit of a... Uh, maybe this does have something of a... Let me let me ask you this: Would you be a little would you be a little kinder to the effect if if it was a case where the all the always sensing thing is is the passive, but you can take an action to try and to try and narrow it to try and narrow it down a little bit? No, no, no. I don't. The thing I don't like is is that moment where it's like, oh, something. I don't like effects which are just constantly on and there's nothing. Effects like this, especially, which are based around detection and understanding that something is there where it's basically constantly turned on. Unless there's some kind of, you know, maybe if it's uh, more important, like if it's a, if this is a card that you play in a dungeon, I'm okay with this. If, if somebody's in a dungeon and they play, you know, you're in my game uh, and you play a card called a detective spell study, and then for the duration of that card, you're going to have that kind of auto sense thing. That lets me know that it's there, and I'm sort of reminded by, it, and I'm reminded by it, and it's in a situation in which your senses would be tuned for that sort of activity. I don't want to go through. I don't want any opportunity for a player to walk through a city and like, do I sense magic? Do I sense magic? Do I sense magic? I don't. I Can like I check for traps. Keep... Can I check for traps? Yeah, I yeah. I, I, I was about to say yeah. the same thing. I, we we all we all know we all now know what he's talking about. It's yeah, the, it's you the, guys you guys get what I mean, right? It's yeah, like it's the, it's the classic. Um, I roll I roll investigation for traps every room. That there there we are. I've I've come up with a thesis statement. I dislike abilities which aid players in being antisocial. <laughs> That's basically what it is, too. Um, there we are. We've 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 come to a conclusion. At not at some. Now at ninth level, we we have wizard's flare, which lets you pick lets you pick a flare to add a to add a extra effect whenever whenever casting spells. So you can cast it with your flare. You can apply flare to a number of, to spells a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier. Applying it to one casting of a spell counts as one expended use. Regardless of the amount of targets the spell or flare affects, you regain all expended uses of your flare when you finish a long rest. Um, this is maybe it's just me, but does this just seem like a um, a form a thematic form of meta magic? <laughs> it's not exactly meta magic, um, well, and not... the reason I say that is because it's it's. It's not, for example, changing the nature of the ver like changing the very nature of how the spell is functioning itself. It adds an additional effect, but it doesn't, for example, minimize the spell or twin the spell or. These are more purely effect. additive effects. Yeah. Yes, these are purely what additive might... rather than metamorphic. You can think of these as basically being universal subclass features, if you will, if that's not too much of a contradiction in terms, which to, it really is. To, con but. to continue from my uh, my example with my guy who liked to cast Chromatic Orb Lightning Edition all the time, um, Big Boom goes on top of it. Now he has his, his uh, Lightning and Thunder. <laughs> um. It'd be fun. It'd be funny as hell to see someone using Big Boom while while um, or not Big Boom, but actually, let, imagine someone casting um, Lightning Bolt with Pungent Smell. <laughs> oh, oh, what? <laughs> That's a little disturbing, but uh, but I do uh like it. You no, know, that makes perfect sense if you've ever smelled roasting person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well the, well, the thing is, with pungent smell, it makes you stink when you cast. Well, I mean, you would stink if you were the one channeling electricity, but I'm now we're just getting into semantics. <laughs> I, I think we should probably cover these five so that, you know, the viewers understand why we're all laughing. Yeah. Let's, okay. take, let's take these one at a time and go into them. Okay, first okay. we have awe and wonder, which can be basically described as adding... as 
adding fireworks to your spells. You choose a creature within 30 feet that can see your spell. That spell, that creature must succeed in a, in a charisma saving throw or be charmed by you for one round. Um, if they take if they take damage from you or an ally while charmed, the effect ends. I, Big... I, I, I'd actually like to call Awe and Wonder something even more um, simple than that, Monk. This is classic magician's misdirection. <laughs> the awe and wonder you get for flash paper and and up comes the, the sheet and then you drop the sheet and nobody's there. <gasps> the entire audience is charmed. That's my only issue with it right now is is I would like to see... I So I marked this one in blue in spite of my misgivings, which are one, the fact that it, it only works on one creature and I don't know how you might scale this. Uh, and two... Though we will come back to... Actually, I do know how you might scale this. We'll go back to that in the subclass hour. Uh, but I don't like the fact that you have to succeed on charisma. I don't like. I don't necessarily like the inclusion of a charisma saving throw. Because that could be in an instance where... Alright, every time I cast a spell now, I'm going to have the GM make me another saving throw. And that could get annoying in 5th edition. And particularly in, in the level up playtest. Because... There's already a ton of saving throws being added, so maybe they should have... This is one of those things that they maybe should have thought in advance and gone a little bit more towards 4th edition, less towards 3.5. Hmm. But, that being said, I do like the idea that you have all these different abilities which can do things like cut down on, uh, for instance, legendary resistance. And by virtue of the fact that you're able to keep popping these effects, just be like... Mm -hmm. Mm, we're going to burn through these a lot faster than was maybe planned for. <laughs> that is cool to me. Yeah. Oh, your your Beholder only has three legendary resistances within his lair? Well then, wizards, fire your flare! <laughs> um, see, then we have Big Boom, which has has the has sim, has similar triggers to to um to what's to what was mentioned before. It's it's just that instead they have to do a constitution saving throw or be deafened for one round. Like this I said, I'm in yellow. Like I said, lightning mm -hmm. spheres with thunderous booms as they hit people. Mm -hmm. Oh, chromatic orb! Never stop being an awesome spell. Um. So that one's like a less interesting. That one's a less interesting condition. A way less interesting condition. And. uh... And it's a con save, and it's also... And then, on top of that, you're provoking a saving throw for something. This is one of those things where somebody pops this out every single round. It's just going to annoy the GM. Well, well it's only up to, they up can't to the number of times every... equal to your intelligence modifier. Yeah. Sure. So, so at, at a maximum of five times in one long rest mm -hmm. period. Right, which could be that could be two com that could encompass two combats if you think about it. Two combats, or sometimes more. I uh, I have been through many meat grinders. They are not fun. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm I'm saying, but you know, think within the context of the game. Yes, I know. Uh, that could be that could be annoying. I'm glad that they do have an overall like limiter on it. That's that's useful for our purposes here. Yeah. Um, next is dis next is distracting, which also works on a also works on a on a uh, charisma save, and and if they fail that charisma save, then they make the, they make their next attack roll with disadvantage. Um. Illusionist, see your heart out. Well, you you did mention the wizard distraction a few a few minutes ago, Zan. So there you go. Yep, this is the one where, um, sleight of hand. They they have you looking at one hand, and they've already thrown the ball over the other mm -hmm. shoulder. Right. This one I marked in blue because this is this is so useful for. Uh, it, it, on, honestly, mostly all of these are blue. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of Big Boom, which are, which is yellow. But like, yeah, this is. This provide spells which would normally not be, which would normally get looked over because they were annoying or frustrating, uh, or or simply did not they they could not justify their own use. In combination with these, can make entire archetypes seem more appealing, because you could use these uh, like if your DM is bad 
at adjudicating the effects of illusionist spells, which is partially the game's fault for being bad at describing them and their effects. Mm -hmm. You could just say, all right, well, there's still a flash of light when this comes up, which is the next one, where you have to succeed on a constitution saving throw or be blinded for one round. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> That's well. Awesome. I just I just got a couple of really bad ideas when it comes to when it comes to um big when it comes to big boom. Um, so one of them is imagine someone casting cloud kill with it. <laughs> That's just mean. Um, <laughs> hold on a second. The other one is someone casting alter self with it. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's one, that's a good one, but flash of light with alter self. Now you're a magical girl. <laughs> but, oh. uh, even better, uh, another, another thing that I could, that, that, uh, that flash of light is good for literal flashbang grenades with once again, chromatic orb, because chromatic orb can be thunder type damage too, oh. which is sonic damage in older editions for anyone who didn't know that. Yeah. Actually, you know, that does offer an opportunity for this to scale upwards at higher levels is perhaps something uh, something along the lines of at 14th level, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, your wizard's flare now affects a number of... now affects an additional creature or now affects a number of creatures equal to your intelligence modifier. Yeah. Um. Or the, uh, the effect just becomes an AoE in that same 30 feet. Right, right. Like, just not a number of creatures, but then it goes from one, choose one creature to all creatures within 30 feet. Which also gives it an element of disadvantage, because if you're in amongst allies, it's going to affect them too. That gives it a little bit of drawback that you have to, so that you have to think about it, and still keeps the scaling. Which would also give you a reason to let the person choose between one or the other. Exactly. And I only want to affect note, one creature. Yeah. Right. It is a final note that would also give you a potential balance opportunity where you say, all right, if you do the AOE, uh, succeeding against the spell means that you automatically succeed against the... If you the succeed flare. against the spell, yeah. you automatically succeed yeah. against the flare. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a final that, disadvantage yeah. to help cut down on the atrocious number of rolls that this thing could provoke. Yeah. Yeah. Um See, flash of flash of light. We've we've already talked about that's a con save or bl or you're blinded by for one round, and then and then punch, punch and smell was the one we were laughing about. Yes, a where you where um, and there's what but there's one other reason why I find this one a bit why I find this one a bit more interesting, especially for ba especially for back row wizards, is the creature must succeed in a Constitution saving throw or be poisoned for one round. A creature poisoned in this way will not willingly move closer to you. No shit, you stink so much they don't want to get any closer. <laughs> this is a this is a wizard who has been hiding in his tower a little over long. Yeah. And hasn't been using create water or heat water heat water to to give himself regular baths. I just have this mental image of of the party trying to clean the plant, trying to clean the wizard like you try to give a cat a bath. Mm, I would more see the party covering the wizard in tomato sauce like you do a dog when they get hit by a skunk. <sighs> either that, either that, or um, or trying to figure out a way to quickly, quickly um. Quickly, clean, quickly wash, quickly wash the wi wash the uh, wizard off of of all this smell, and then someone realizes, wait, we have a wait, we have an artificer. He can he can make a high pressure fire hose. Cast prestidigitation to change the way he smells. <laughs> That's gonna be fun once we get to our exploration acts. Yeah. Uh, one sure. one it's one last hist historical side note I'd like to make. The uh, uh, the aroma killing properties of tomatoes were known far back in history because that's why they were planted around so many outhouses. Mm -hmm. I have to wonder if that's the reason why we why you have why over in in some countries you have you have the whole thing of throwing tomatoes during festivals. Might be. But now, when it comes to exploration necks, um. So let's see. We've got we've um, we've got 
for all intents and purposes, we have a page's worth. It's just that some of them are a bit are a bit wordier than others. Looking right at you, Presto, Presto Digitation. Which, uh, <laughs> incident, incidentally, um, I think we can all be honest with ourselves. We all screwed up the pronunciation of Presto Digitation at least once in our life. Once in this episode, I did, at the very least. Um, maybe? But it would, I would have had to have been really young. I use this as a... I use a variation of the word prestidigitation as as the way to uh to describe what I do as a job in a flippant way. <laughs> the master of tech digitation. Yeah, I'm just saying we probably we probably screwed up the name as ki as kids. Yeah. Um. Presto but, change it. Let's just call it that. <laughs> but um, detect the magic savant. Basically, it basically is at, is adding extra is a lot. You're able to add extra effects when you use detect magic. See, now that's meta magic. Mm -hmm. Especially since you pick that you pick this one knack and you've got and you've got three options with it. Although, um, in my, in my experience, um, detect spell detect spells weren't used weren't used all that much and the now granted I'd I'd say I'd say that they get I'd say that they get more I'd say that they get more use um in in um 5e I am um, this is a huge your mileage may vary I uh, I the only uh, ex <clears throat> Like they've they've made an appearance in every single five E campaign I've been in. Detect magic, really? Yeah, yeah. That's this is why I said like your your mileage may vary. Yeah, that's that's really surprising. Actually, I haven't seen detect magic all that often in any five E campaigns I've been a part. And of. And it's one of those things that isn't really transferable between campaigns. It it like this is a honestly this is something of a like a table thing. I suspect. Mm. Like even if you have rotating DMs and stuff like that, the style that your table sort of evolves around is going to determine you know, whether people use it a lot or not. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's. I, I was just as surprised when I heard that there were tables that did that didn't use them frequently. Or rather, let let me um, let me cor let me correct myself slightly. Um, there were there have been plenty of detect spells that would get that would get use. Detect magic would would be the one that was the was the third wheel in that situation. Which is you're right. Which my my statement still stands. Like I think this is your mileage may vary. I've I'm outlining this in yellow because it bores me. Uh, duration of detect magic is increased by ten minutes. Radius increase. Penetration increase. Penetration is a little bit more forgivable. Uh, it should. I honestly think it should be something like hey. But detection spells in general, things like that, should be able to, in some capacity, be cast remotely or activated as kinds of traps. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like. I would like the I would like the wizard to be able to inscribe a pebble magically. Like, you want wards. You want magical wards, is what you. Yes. Want. Yes. yes. I want. I want basically divination, divinatory wards, which could apply to detect magic, but could also d apply to. Other spells, and I think that would be far more fitting for a wizard's exploration axe than just enhancing the one. I, um, I think they, I think they got a little bit too much tunnel vision here. That's my frustration, especially when there's a there's an a, there's a better better ability hiding in here. That's that's my statement on it. Monk, evidence that I have been hanging out with a specific friend of ours too much. I'm giggling at the descriptors for all three of these detect magic metamagics. <laughs> Lengthened, extended, and penetrating. Seriously, are we not using phrasing anymore? <laughs> you can tell I've been hanging out with our friend too much. Um I was gonna say either that or you've or um or you've been you have been playing DMC four and using the Lucifer too much. Mm, with great force. <laughs> But in the end, Monk, we are all satisfied. <laughs> if, you had, if if there was a rose on your desk right now, I'm going to punch you. 
I mean, do you count a rose painted on packaging? No. Okay, then I'm fine. Anyway, um, <laughs> I think eidetic memory, which set, which says that you can a accurately recall anything that you've read within the last two weeks, is going to be a uh, mileage may vary kind of thing. I, I was tempted that, to mark this in red. I paint this red for two reasons. Yeah. One, eidetic memory is all memory, and it's always. It's not just what you read. It's literally everything you're remembering. Um, eidetic memory remembers, like, we've, we've, we've done experimentation. The memories are done in full pictures. Like, you don't see the words and read them in your head. It is a picture of the page of the book you are reading. It's a snapshot. You think, um, should this, should, do you think this should have been rewritten to be more, to be more like the, um, more like the way, say, um, Th say Thane from Mass Effect uh, does his does his whole memory thing. Oh yeah, my God! Would... Please describe to me. Just describe to me what the what he does with the memory thing. Thane I'm uses you. A, specific, a specific set of mnemonics, I believe mm -hmm. it was. Yeah, in order to he basically he basically is he basically has a, a kind of perfect memory um, motif that's that's shared among his species. They can they can recall they can recall events as if they were re, as if they were reliving them. Ooh, okay. So that that actually is a dedic memory. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has a dedic memory when they when they recall something, it's recalled as it was happening from their point of view. That's why I said it's it's remembered like a snapshot. Yeah. Um, so if I were to adjust this, I could do. I had an initial plan for that, but that's. I, I might as well say the the initial plan was just putting an add on to this, which was again a social component, which is I think where this comes into play is like okay, the the smart guy type character is so good at their job, and because they're so good at their job, when they're able to when they're really operating in their element, like this, like yes, I remember the gate address. I've been watching a shit ton of Star uh, Stargate, so that's going to keep coming up uh, for probably the next six months. Uh, nothing I can really do about that. Uh, then they get this this proct specific social event. But based on your description of what's just been described, which everybody will remember if they had a different memory, uh, the it's the idea of reliving, basically being able to this species being able to relive these memories as they were happening. I would adjust this slightly differently so that you could literally relive that memory plus you could go outside the bounds of your own p point of view because you're a wizard that makes sense because you're a wizard because there and we could put certain restrictions on it like okay anything that was not in your point of view is going to be shown basically black but you're going to have the outline so if you didn't see the person that was hiding in the bushes uh 30 feet to the right you're not going to see their face. You're just going to see a black outline. But do you know that a person was there? But you know that a person was there, mm -hmm. right? That would be a that would be a really cool one. I'd uh, I'm going to write that down hard right now for Lords of Brachus because I'm stealing that. <laughs> we gave him ideas, Monko. No. <laughs> but, uh, but Ash, um, for for me. If you're going to name that, you need to name it a little bit of a meme. Total Recall. I don't... Yeah, yeah, I think that one works. I think, <laughs> I, think I have to do that. I don't really think I have an option here. You don't. I've given you the idea. All right, yeah, Total... Total Recall. Because I'm sorry, but that needs to... That... <laughs> That's a Total Recall. Mm-hmm. Um, but now in in this in this case, what I would rename this to, if only for thematic purposes, is mnemonic memory. Mm -hmm. Just because it's, you're using, you, you're likely using a mnemonic to perfectly recall anything you've read. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is which is something people actually do in real life. They use mnemonics to recall things they've done. Um, eidetic memory. And, and just a just a small expansion for you on that one, Ash, with the Drell in Mass Effect. I know, I know Rails, but 
Um, their eidetic memory is such an evolutionary marker for their for their species that it can be involuntarily in, evoked by um, very strong uh, external pressures that are that, that would tie to such a memory, such as oh, smells okay. or sounds. Okay, so, it, which I most... could I mean I could also put that in Lords of Rag because <laughs> cer certain people are able to force you to play certain cards. That would that would be funny. Um. Yeah, so um, the cyan walks up and forces you to undergo this thing and renders you catatonic for however long. However geez. long the effect lasts. It, um, as it was depicted in Mass Effect, it's usually a couple seconds. And they're still aware of of uh, um, of the fact that it's a memory, but sometimes they just like to live that memory and stay in it rather than what they're doing. A uh, Fane's specific example is... On lonely nights, he likes to replace his lonely night with a memory of a perfect night, with a perfect partner. Of course. Classic. Yeah, he basically relives the memory with somebody he loved. I think it was his wife. Mm -hmm. um, now next is Illusion Detective. You have advantage on investigation checks and intelligence saving throws made against the Illusion. Whenever you successfully de detect an Illusion... For the next 10 minutes, you gain a bonus to investigation and perception checks equal to half your wizard level. Um, I get that it's trying to go for the whole you can't bullshit a bullshitter, but I find this one kind of boring. Thank you. It's just because the prerequisite is at least one illusion spell in your spell book. I would appreciate it if there was an exploration knack for, again, producing additional cool illusions that anybody could take. I, under, I understand that there's going to be an illusionist of some variety, or, or a school of glamours, or something like that in the subclasses that undoubtedly come out for this document, but I would appreciate it if this wasn't like, because this is the passive effect. Let's look at the effect. You have advantage on investigation checks, intelligence saving throws, made against illusions. If you're investigating the check and all of a sudden your DM says, oh yeah, make it with advantage, you're going to be like, oh, well, this is an illusion. And then you're probably going to succeed anyways. But, like, if you weren't going to succeed, that kind of... Uh, that's a dissonance that probably doesn't need to be there. And the reason I say it doesn't need to be there is because the second half of the ability is when you successfully detect an illusion, for the next ten minutes, you get a bonus for investigation and perception checks equal to half your wizard level. So, if the first illusion that you actually detect works like 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 your or sorry your investigation check works your dm could do something like ask you hey what's like what's the bonus that you're ostensibly going to get to this thing and the next time an illusion comes up you could just say all right roll normally and then they roll normally and then you adjust the dc or you remember that they have that bonus it's just that the character and the, and the by extension, the player don't know that they have that bonus. Mm -hmm. That's a way you're able to you're able to pre sort of preserve a little bit more of the illusion, and you don't have to preserve the illusion and 100 percent of it. I mean, the illusion at the table, not the illusion within the within the context of the game that we're discussing. Like you don't have to preserve that 100 percent of the time. But if you don't need to break it, and there's a better way of doing it in this instance, then just do it do it that better way would be my recommendation. Mm. I would simply do it better. Now, my professional opinion as a designer. Yeah. Um, when it comes to next is lore master and trap of lore master of travel. You are well traveled and well studied. You have advantage on history checks to recall information regarding to myths and legends that are location based. In addition, when you arrive at a new location, you automatically know any history, legends or myths related to it. The GM can withhold pertinent secret information at their discretion. This one has a social element for you there. Um, it has the, it has the social element, but um, shouldn't this be for a bard? <laughs> like, uh, no, no, not not with the source material we're working with. <laughs> using the superior fancy and casters, using uh. <laughs> Unpronounceable the Magician and Iconu, which I'm also mispronouncing. 
and the various the various characters of the dying earth i mean these guys were the traveling wizards <laughs> there's nothing to there's nothing to really get around that like these people traveled to faraway lands pretty consistently in order to go out and because if you're working in the post-apocalyptic assumptions of the source material uh everybody who is a wizard is not really very few of them are real masters of reality insofar as they're able to produce these things on their own most of them are really efficient scavengers with an affinity for magic and were able to make something of themselves because in the process of combing through the ruins of civilization were able to through a combination of discovering artifacts and discovering lost spells and ancient technology were able to make a name for themselves and that is definitely my preference insofar as i think those wizards are way cooler than anybody who's just oh well i was an apprentice and then i the world and that's kind of my deal i'm like yeah plus at the level uh, one thing that should be noted what level do you get this at um scroll it's up it's a ex it is a exploration knack, and since it is, since it it is, it doesn't have a level prerequisite, you could get this at third at the earliest. Well, there you go, third level. Surely you're you've been some places by the time you get to third level, or at least I hope so. Unless you've been apprenticing to a wizard who's a hermit, son of a bitch. <laughs> which I'm way, which I'm way less interested in, you know. I know you are. I'm just saying it's a reality you have to uh, acknowledge exists. Yeah. Right. In which case, you could adjust that for like, all right, well, this is just something you're the wizard that you were apprenticed to was, was one a of traveling those wizard. Cool, yeah. <laughs> was one of those cool Vancian spellcasters who you got to live in the shadow of. But because you got to live in the shadow of one of these awesome Vancian spellcasters, uh, you managed to pick up a little bit of knowledge about these other locations that they got to go adventure in. I have a feeling he has a bias here, Monk. What do you think? I have an extreme bias. I've, I've fucking <laughs> made, uh, little video gamey wizards and stuff like that. I've gotten, I've grown to dislike them, mostly because of the games I've, I, I've been playing. That's, that's not really the fault of. Well, I'm that, sure that there that are sounds, cool, that sounds I'm sure like there are cool non vancian mages out there. Ash, there's plenty. Ash, that sounds that sounds like a case of what Malcolm Tucker would call nomfop. I got him. <laughs> nomfop, NFFP, not my fucking problem. Um, but the thing, the the reason what I'm not opposed Nobody to the idea. We have those cool Vancian casters. Okay, now okay, now you um, casting bait is out of season, and I don't feel like getting in trouble with the DNR again. Uh huh. <laughs> anyway, um. Lore Master of Creatures, however, that one I'm a, I'm a little I'm a little bit more I'm a little bit more will, willing to go, willing to um the thing when it comes to when it comes to both of the Lore Master things the the big the big problem the big problem that I have is that the the way that they've been describing wizards in this book is leaning towards is leaning towards more of them being the reclusive professor kind of archetype. Um, and because of that, I do f I do feel like there should be an emphasis on the on them being book smart, but not necessarily street smart. That se that seems to be the vibe that they that they're going with. Putting aside putting aside the alleged superiority of the event of the Vancian style, that's some um, that's for as far as far as I'm concerned with this, that's irrelevant. The ver the version that they're presenting is very much the reclusive the reclusive professor the person who spends all of their time in their laboratory or or the like on on whatever project they have to be working at for a university. Um, and the only one that breaks the mold is that lore master of travel. Yeah, no lore master of creatures. I mean that is literally the first character that you're introduced to in the dying earth. What did I just say? <laughs> well, the thing that you just said was that the Vancian spellcasters were irrelevant to this. And that's where the problem is. Like, when we're going off the narrative archetypes that these people are drawing on, 
And one of these things is sort of like that first, like, because this could be Daniel Jack. Well, not Daniel Jackson. Who's the. He's not really. Yeah. There's not really like a Team B series in SG1. See, this is my problem with relying too much on the singular uh, source material. Says the guy who's been using who's been using Dying Earth this entire night. I'll get to listen. I'll get to Jack of Shadows and uh, <laughs> Princess of Amber eventually. I That's just got okay. No, you see, there we go. Princess of Amber. That system of magic is great because it's not Vantian, and it's basically just from your head and your heart. No, that's like Vance. It's like Vance adjacent. You still have to like hang spells and stuff like that. It's just not in the. It's more gameable, if that makes sense. But we could get to that. We could get to that later. And to hang anyway, spells they cast. They cast impromptu spells all the time in the twelve books. In twelve books. Anyway, ten. Excuse me. Twelve. Right, it, no, exactly. it's. But they no, they do hang those spells and stuff like that. They just do in advance. They could keep them hung for a lot longer. It's not a Vance, it's not the Vantian thing where it's like, oh well I went to sleep, so now I forget it. It's like, no, you can keep them you could keep them around and stuff like that. Rails. Which is which is why I think they're yay. Which you didn't notice because it's because it allowed you to get to the action. There was very rarely times where it's like well, the spells I had hung on me have gone stale, and I don't really have... I don't have time to do another one right now, so I have to more rely on my wits. Those those instances were rare, which is why I say that system is a little bit more gameable. And, and they, like, it's Vance adjacent, but it strips out some of the negative gameplay elements that were troubles with Vance, depending on your perspective. Anyway... But no, no. You and I will definitely go over that later. <laughs> okay. Because, I mean, any excuse that we have to talk about Nine Princes and Amber is just fantastic. Yes. There is one particular problem that I do, that I do have with Loremaster of Creatures, and that is, that is the fact that it is... Go that it is going to be a, is going to be a little bit on the specific end of things because you have to choose one creature type um now if lore master of creatures is an exploration knack that you could choose multiple times i'd be i'd be a little more fine with it but i but i don't see that here the it doesn't it doesn't say that so i assume it's just once whereas something like lore master of travel you're going to uh, you're um you're going to you're going to you're going to get use of that more frequently. You're only going to get use of Lore Master of Creatures if the appropriate creature is in the campaign. So it's a table may vary kind of thing. Right. Which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a reason to strike it. Cause I still that I understand these matters of inconvenience and stuff like that, but I don't know. I don't know. If there was we could we could add one tiny thing. We could add one line to this. Basically, I, I can't really provide that one line, but I can provide the essence of that one line. Where if you are able to connect the myth to a creature that you're making a history check on, you get that extra information. Like if if this type of dragon has a specific if you're. Uh, Exploration Act is focused on elementals, and you're trying to do some research on the dragon, you would have some capacity to get more information about them because of this type of dragon's interactions with the elementals. Or any myths around elementals in this particular dragon. And that would afford you additional information. So it's still focused on your area of expertise, but you are permitted this ambient or adjacent knowledge when focusing on other objects. Uh, subjects. Does that make sense? I and would that alleviate the problem? Mm. It'd be a bandage. There, like, oh, what, there what is the problem in particular? The, prob the problem is specificity. Given, given how, given how few, um, how few knacks that you're you're going. You're only going to be getting a a small um, a small amount of knacks over your career, and because of that, an individual choice on a knack has to have a has to have a significant amount of impact. This is what this is why I don't mind. Um, I don't mind multi. I don't mind. Um, say feats, 
in 5e that ha that to bring multiple things to the table in this instead of just one static modifier because um, you get them so infrequently yeah right and when it comes and when it if if um if exploration knacks were something were something that you got at the at the rate of say bonus feats for a third edition fighter something like lore master of creatures i would be perfectly fine with and there probably would be the caveat of you can purchase this multiple types each, multiple times and each time you do you you um you can you can pick another you can pick another one or have it that you can you can change what your um specialty is during a during a long rest something something like that so that it so that some so that somebody isn't angsting whether or not they whether or not they end up picking a specialty that's going to end up being useless yeah like depending on the campaign you could choose undead and never run into one especially right. since the gm is under no obligation to tell you what sort of creatures that you're going to be dealing with mm mhm you get these at third level. Um, I see. I don't like the solution of like just being able to swap it out because I like the I like the idea that okay, if you grab a fighting style and you grab a particular fighting style, you're going to stick with that, even in a system which allows you to eventually swap it out. Like with training or at certain level interventions, you're sort of stuck with that fighting style because that does say something about your character. That does say something about your mechanics. It's a, a degree of permanency. I'm not entirely sure. To... What, I'm not entirely sure why you're using that as a um, as a frame of comparison because a fighting style is. Let's, I'll get to it. No, no. Let, let me finish. I'm well aware they're different things. That's that's going to feed into my argument here. So if you have a degree of permanency, ostensibly you're going to have a little bit. You're going to pay a little bit more attention to these choices that you're going to be making. Um, but with a fighting style, you're able to use a specific, like, if you choose Duelist, you yourself as that character are able to provoke sp that particular effect by constantly using a one-handed weapon and wielding no weapons in the other hand. You're able to provoke that effect. With this, you're not really able to provoke the effect, it's entirely reactive. Which is why I say, if you give it a, if you give it an opportunity, so that you, all you need to do is have some capacity to always provoke an effect from this ability. Like you're always able to make a bone charm because your specialty is undead. You're always able to pr make a dragon scale that gives somebody a bonus to AC. But when it comes to when the time comes and your specific area of expertise does come up, you're able to do something even cooler, you're even more special, be it much like the Paladin. Like, the fact that the Paladin's Divine Smite is cool regardless of whether or not you're fighting undead or fiends. But when you are fighting undeads or fiends, the Divine Smite is even cooler. And, like, there's this... I don't know... I personally... The reason I'm explaining all this out is I don't actually know where that specific line is for, or that, that Venn diagram of ability that has a specific benefit when you're in your area of expertise, but also has a more general benefit that's cool writ large. And I think that's, I think that's where the three of us should be focusing rather than how do we make it so that you could swap this ability out to be always your ex area of expertise on the daily. Does that make sense? I'm, on, I'm only bringing up the swapping thing because there's a because there's a pre because of precedent. Um, but there's also there's also the f because I've se when it comes to this particular thing, I've seen it done. In, I've seen it done either either in the case of being able, allowing people to hot swap, um, or or the fact that they get that at at certain thresholds they get they get. Um, additional studies, right? Um, fantasy with something like fantasy craft, you're going to be getting stud. You're going to be getting additional studies, whether that be languages or an expertise, just by leveling up. And you'll already it softens the blow of not having access to your area of expertise when you have multiple areas of expertise. Well, that and that and the way um, it's a little bit unfair for me to use to use that because of how um, fantasy craft handles knowledge checks period but i'm getting ahead of myself 
Um, the last one and the longest one on this is Presto Prestidigitation. Try saying that five <laughs> times fast. Presto, Gentlemen, presto, presto, thumbs up or thumbs presto, down? Presto, Go around the table. Presto, presto, what, what did you highlight presto. this as? Um, I, I I highlighted it as blue just for the fact that it keeps you clean all the time. Monk, what have you got? Red, um, blue, or yellow? I am I am putting th I am putting this as a yellow. Really? All right, you go first then. You're the odd man out. Um. Actually, no. Actually, no. I, I take I take it back. Um. Upon further examination, no. This is this is probably the blue. This is probably the bluest of the bunch. <laughs> um. You might as well go first anyway, since they had a moment of trepidation, which is permitted. Um. And encouraged. I do. Th I do. This is kind. Um, it is, it is kind of, it is kind, it does feel a bit like a, um, kit bash. Um, like it's, like it has two different, like it has two different styles mm -hmm. of effects at, uh, at the same time, because you do have the, you have the, you remember how I talked about the mix of, pa of passive and active in, in one benefit? Um, that's what we basically have here. When you're not, when you're not actively casting press the digitation or concentrating on a spell, your your stuff is sparkly clean. When you do cast press the digitation, you get more you get more options that you can pick from. Like I said, the sparkly clean is what got me. That's why I got the blue. <laughs> it's like presto changeo, my clothes are always clean, bitches. Um, I like it. No, no, it's it, it is. This expands the. The fact that this, I know earlier I mentioned like oh these the designers have a little bit of tunnel vision when it comes to these particular spells but like every wizard has pressed the digitation as one of their cantrips as determined by the designers so every wizard could get not only some use out of this but like it is guaranteed to have a lot to have a lot of fun with it I think mm -hmm. oh. it's just I mean it's just fun. It's just fun. <laughs> it's such a it's such a whimsical expression of the wizard, which uh, makes its appearance in practically practically any narrative source that you could think of, where where the wizard has this this element of whimsy, and he's just out there vibing, and has a few magical tricks with which to aid his vibe. And so he casts and he vibes and he vibes and he casts and we are all delighted by his presence. That's why I marked this in blue. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, overall, though, the level up the level up version is a is a slight improvement, but i don't I don't think that this is going to improve the overall um pick rate when it comes to wizards because unless I'm mistaken wizards wizards are de are on the lower end of pick frequency um for a lot for a lot of people when it espe when, especially when compared to their fellow casters they've got a i believe they're on par with that they, they're more common than let's see they're more common than druids. Because druids are the least common full caster. I believe they're on par with bards. And I think they're slightly more common than sorcerers and warlocks, at least to the obviously the the data from D things like D D Beyond, which obviously there's a huge source issue there where a factor some sort of factor analysis would need to be performed to see how many of these results were valid and a sec hopefully a secondary study which could verify how off the mark the D D Beyond study was. But the point being they're they're slightly more common than you might think. Well the the um the one that the one that I see the one that I see the one um caster that I see um get talked about the get talked about the most is um 
is f is warlocks. But the big pr the big problem w the big problem when it comes to when it comes to wizards that that can arguably make them a little a little bit less of an appeal is the fact that is the fact that they're a bit too ge they're a bit too generalist. And the only th the only thing with some of these there have been signif there have been very significant changes. With the wizard, there hasn't been a whole lot of change. Like the big, the big, the big change that we that we saw was, uh, as far as far as what could potent what could potentially um mo what could potentially be a mover and shaker for it is the rejiggering of um of spell of spell ma of um spell mastery into the form of signature spells. Right. Um. I mean, spell spell study is ex is exactly what we kind of thought it would be, and wiz and wizard's flare is all right, but it's but I wouldn't really say it's a shake up move. Um, and when it comes to expl, I don't know about you, but when it came to the list of exploration necks, I feel like they I feel like they should have there that they should have had some um sentence put sentence thrown in that they that they could borrow from a few other classes because the I don't know why, but it feels like the exploration next given for on um, this document is a bit small for the wizard. It's a bit off in regards to the if if you were to compare these to some of the other classes, I I don't think that this is their best work, and the the problem is goes back to source material, which I did say I was going to bring up. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, let's have, let's address the elephant in the room. <laughs> Well, yeah. Let's let's talk about things like Vancian versus uh, Zelaznian. There's got to be a better name for that. I don't think we could call it Zelaznian. Uh, Sandersonian. Ambrite. 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 That I do like. That I do like because there's a name in setting. I don't suppose I could do Sandersonian, which I don't particularly care. Well, he's about got two Sanderson. different. He's got two different uh, works. Any two different un works with two different universes, anyway. So. Right, so that wouldn't work. I uh, definitely don't care about Tolkien, so I don't... But the point being, there's a lot of different magic out there and a lot of different conceptions of the wizards, and they are most divergent from the source material that Gary was working with, which was primarily based on, primarily based on Vance. And Vance, the initial express... I think the big problem is that the initial expression of Vancean magic had so many had accumulated so many inconveniences that it became difficult to distinguish any inconvenience from a problem with the design of the system writ large rather than as a design advantage or as a balancing mechanic or something that could be made satisfying with small adjustments without without destroying the fantasy of it uh, but that didn't happen. So when I reintroduced Vancey and Magic to things like two people by way of Lords of Brachus, I get to you know I get to use a card game. And Vancey, and, Vancey and Magic is very card like. You draw your hand at the start of the day, and as you as you play each card, you you discard it after having played it. And then you know once you once you do your spell study whatever, you get to draw a a new hand. And that basic structure is, I think, pretty cool. And it's a good design expression, but it started out as you get to cast one spell and it takes you a day and four hours. It, it you have to you can't do it again until the next day, at which point you have to spend four hours in order to memorize it, and then you can do it again and stuff like like you started at such a low power level that you weren't you were in the same system as Vance, but you weren't fulfilling the same fantasy as Vance. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah, though that's not a, that's not exactly the elephant in the room that I w that I was discussing. Oh well, shit! Why'd you let me ramble on? Because it's so so much fun to hear you ramble on. Well, I do appreciate that. Um, no, I, w <laughs> I was referring to concentration. Oh! oh. <laughs> I knew what he was talking about. <laughs> that is something which doesn't exist in Vancey Magic, by the way. Thank, I, thank you, Vance. 
Uh, that doesn't exist in most magic, of course, which is why I'm just being cheeky. But yeah, so th there have been no mentions of concentration across the entirety of this document, not even in the Exploration Acts, which I was shocked by, frankly, because I, I figured I would see something about, like, well, while in the course of wilderness travel, you have advantage on concentration checks. I thought I would at least see it in the Exploration Acts in some sort of relatively oh, boring past wait, ability. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Go ahead. Thinking back on the previous level ups we've done, I don't remember seeing a mention of concentration checks on any of the full or partial casters. That's because that's because none of the documents that we've gone that we've gone into thus far have de have delved in have delved into the the spell list. Yeah, the spell the spell list or if there's any changes to the hard and fast rules when it comes to actually spell casting. But that they wouldn't have to. They would have, they would just have to include a mention of it. And I thought there was one there might have been one in sorcerer, but this is the the fact that that would be the only example I could think of is is in it, of itself interesting, but well, and I was going to say the fact that there's been a lack of mention within any of the the class rules, um, when you when you would want to look to improve a frankly abysmal part of the casting system in the uh, in five e, you'd think they'd address it. So I I almost want to say that they're either going to just leave it as is and not touch it, or they're going to eschew it entirely. That makes me nervous. Those are two very different right? extremes. Because if, if we're right and it hasn't been mentioned at, in any of these documents, that means that if they do leave it in, as is, we're not even going to have access to any kind of modifiers to it. We're not going to have anything that makes it slightly more interesting. Or really more interesting. Or, or any kind of modifiers to it. Not even in exploration. Not even in social context. Or social situations, certainly not in combat. Nothing. We'll have to wait until they put out the magic rules. Yeah. Oh man. I am not looking. Now I... I'm. <laughs> Why'd you have to give me this anxiety, Dash? Why? I I now also have this anxiety. I can't. There's nothing I can really do about that. Is is I would like. There's got to be some way to get in contact with these folks and just bug them constantly. Like, hey, hey, what's going on with concentration? What's going on with concentration? And, and, and you know the you know their answer will be wait until the magic rules come out, right? I I, I, che I checked well, that. I as you guys were, on the door. as you guys were talking. I checked. I looked back and checked the the do checked the documents that I have for the sorcerer, and then I looked at the druid because because that because the druid was the first casting class that we had. It's not in there. No, the I was right. There was no 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 concentration. Rules in previous casting classes. Oh, uh, um, that's yeah. Now, um, uh, the is, the issue the issue that I, the issue that I've that I've had, and I think I think that Ash has has also had when it comes to this whole concentration thing, is is the fact is the fact that concentration is essentially a passive. What not one? It's a passive affair, and two, um. You have to you have to be constantly focusing on maintain on maintaining that one spell, which is why it which is why it's almost a requirement for wizards to learn haste. Yeah, you end up coming up with your own particular signature spell that every single combat needs to be opened with or and maintained for the duration of that three round combat. Because if you end up switching spells, uh, you're not going to switch from haste to Big B's hand. Or something of that variety, because then you've if Big B's hand doesn't work out, you sort of wasted pace. And you're playing this very concentration turns what was already a relatively high stakes game into something ridiculously high stakes to the extent that like taking any risk is likely a bad idea. Especially when you could just resolve the combat, probably could resolve the combat to begin with by just casting three fireballs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the reality of the situation, is a lot of control spells are theater and fun, which many of which can change otherwise deadly combats into, into more skillfully developed combats, but could also just be resolved often more quickly by just 
casting three fireballs. This is a situation which this goes back to our advanced discussion where this is not merely an inconvenience. This is a restriction from participating in the fantasy of being a wizard. The more that I, the more they think about the concentration issue, um, for starters, the reason why the reason why I think the wizard ends up getting the brunt of it is because it doesn't have it doesn't have enough features to distract from it. Whereas you, right. you look at you look at the you look at a lot of the other casting classes and they have they have some or some other feature some other gimmick to soften the blow. You have wild shape. You have bardic inspiration. Literally every other casting class Meta -magic. has something to make use of. Mm -hmm. Meta magic. If we're gonna go on to Sork. Yeah. Now, oh, and of course, of course, some, um, of course, in the case of Warlock, they have they have invocations, all the packs and invocation mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, pack to the fiend. I want my temp HP, please. Now, <laughs> in um, in fourth edition, the closest that there were certain spells that you had to that you had to spend one of your, that you had to spend a specific type of action in order to maintain in order to keep maintaining it. Um. And that that fell in with the whole, with the whole action economy that fourth edition had. Um, third edition had it had it as a and um, Pathfinder as well had concentration as a skill check. Um, you had to you had to roll you had to roll concentration other, otherwise you may end up otherwise you may end up um, dropping that spell. Yeah, it was an active check rather than a passive. If you get dinged and you'd, by anything, you'd usually ha you'd usually have to roll it if you were if you if you were concentrating on a spell and somebody dinged you. I was just about to ask: was that would was that just something that would come up? Like, okay, the d like how often did that realistically come up? As o as but often as you're getting hit. You? <laughs> if, What's up? If um if you get. If the wizard gets attacked while co while concentrating, then you'd have to roll the check. Is that not how it works in fifth? Yes, with the exception of now, if you're also concentrating on an additional spell, uh, what well, you can't concentrate on an additional concentration spell. You can only have one up at one time. The whole the whole one the whole one at one time thing. What uh, it's been a while since third, but I do not recall that being a factor. Well, that, that's why I wanted to ask is basically like the third edition thing. I wasn't aware that that was actually present in third edition. I thought I thought the problem was all of these things would just run to the maximum duration until somehow, unless maybe the spellcaster took some, was able to take some action to negate them. But the fact that this is how often would that fail? That concentration check. Maybe that's a better question. If I recall, it was level dependent. the D The DC that you had to pass was dependent on how on the on how powerful the um the spell the spell was. And I'm I'm actually lo I'm actually loading up the um, D20 SRD right now. And this being three X, you would have access to you would be able to pump these numbers pretty high. Well, yeah, I concentration was a never. concentration was a skill that you could put ranks into. But okay, so I'm I'm looking at it right now. Concentration check. You must make a concentration check whenever you might potentially be distracted by taking damage by harsh weather and so on while engaged in some action that requires your full attention. Some actions include casting a spell, concentrating on an active spell, directing a spell, using a spell like ability, use or using a skill that would provoke an AOO. If the concentration check succeeds, you may continue with the action as normal. If the check fails, the action automatically fails and is wasted. If you are in the process of casting a spell, the spell is lost. If you are concentrating on an active spell, the spell ends as if you had ceased concentrating on it. If you are directing a spell, the direction fails, but the spell remains active. If you are using a spell-like ability, the use of the ability is lost. A skill use also fails. Um, and then they have they have a table that, sh that demonstrates the... How the kind of DC. DC. Yeah, the kind yeah. of DC. For example, um, if you're damaged during an action, the DC is 10 plus the damage dealt. Um, if it's continuous damage, it's 10 plus half the continuous damage. Um, if you're distracted by a non-damaging spell, it's the save DC of the distracting spell. Plus um, the spell level of what you're casting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when it comes to... It basically has a, a table for DCs on cons, on concentration depending on conditions, and that's yeah. it. But it but it wasn't concentration was not a on off switch like it is in five. And it's not it's not a singular on off on off switch. Yeah, because in, in five uh It's it's an on off switch for any time you uh any, there's there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot a lot of t with a lot of times you have the the whole the whole thing of duration of X amount of time or or concentration. Um that concentration didn't didn't take effect with that. It was more of it was more of you're maintaining the spell for for as for as for as long as you, for as long as you feasibly wished, other, if other if not stated. Um, other so uh, this wasn't ending spells prematurely that often, is what I'm hearing. No, because the concentration check was what the DC was different based on what you were done uh, done what was being done to you, and mm -hmm. oftentimes if you're a caster casting, you're not in the front ranks, you're not likely to get hit by anything other than other casters casting. Somebody, some goblin managed to throw a dart at you, and so yeah, it's not something like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, well, I see what that have. And so the to give people a brief overview overview of our problems before we head into the subclass hour is like I'd like to posit. I'd like to posit one theory when it comes to when it comes to Five E's take on concentration. Um, Go ahead. I've said I've said that I've said in the past that the that the whole uniting of the editions thing has a whole lot of things that are you have a whole lot of things that are that were in previous editions, but the full context of the full context of where they were used originally was not is not fully understood. Like say the argument of hit dice being a, being the successor to healing surges. Um, in this case. It's trying. It's trying to do the spend an action to maintain approach with, that was in um, that was in fourth edition. The problem is it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a large enough action economy to justify it. And, I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a case. I think oh, it, I really let, think this. Hang is... on. Hang on. Let, let me let me let me finish what I mean. All right. A a spell a power that would require main that would require maintaining. Like it, it would be say maintain minor or maintain move or maintain standard. Basically, you drop that particular type of action, but you'd still be, but the rest of your suite of actions you'd still get access to. You'd still have access to a minor action. You'd still have access to free actions. You'd still have access to reactions. You'd, if um, if it was maintain standard, for instance. Um, whereas the action economy in in um in 5e is significantly smaller when it comes to the when it comes to the action types you actively have available that is that is what that is where I'm going with this kind of thing right that's that's not quite a, um, I I wish that were the case because that would make the solution to this issue a lot a lot easier in reality, what I think is happening is because this is 5e being designed as sort of a the 3.5 retirement home, designed as offloading burdens that various people had while playing Pathfinder and 3x. It, one of the biggest problems were fights would become too. So I had this discussion with Dan Felder, who was a tabletop game designer. Uh, I guess technically speaking, it is off time. He's a video game. He's a designer for Electronic Arts, actually. I feel bad for him right now. Uh, believe it or not, Dan is one of the best. Believe it or not, he's. Uh, I do. I do hope I'm, he's. I'm talking about the recent uh, EA hack. Oh, oof. Yeah. So oof. I said, I feel. I feel bad for him right now. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Shit. I'm gonna have to. No. I'm gonna check up on him uh, probably tomorrow. <laughs> but it's. So, so the five E was developed as a set of band aids for all these problems that people were having in three point five. 
So abilities are far more spread out so that and you make very rarely make choices in character creation. But a lot of these abilities are somewhat recognizable to people who are playing the game. And so they get to like, oh, well, this is this provokes kind of the same feeling as when I was ma making my character in 3.5 because I'm reading down this list of abilities. Never mind that you don't actually get any of these. It doesn't it, it feels reminiscent of this other game that I was playing, except it's far less of a cognitive load to actually go through, which is where we come to the spellcasting. There was a complaint when I was talking with Dan Felder, there was a complaint that everybody would cast the same spread of spells before a given combat. I'm going to cast my magic weapons and magic armors and all my beginning of the day bookkeeping. And once we get in the combat, I'm going to cast a shield of faith and this spiritual weapon and this and that and everything. It would always be the same lowdown. And you wouldn't need to, once you developed a specific strategy with your team, you that could become so effective that it would bulldoze ev over anything in your way. And so all encounters would play out to maybe not the same, but extraordinarily similar and would become boring. Fifth edition solution was to cut down on the number of spells that you would be able to have active. And unfortunately, this produced the exact same situation where... Every time I go into a combat as a wizard, I'm going to cast haste. I'm probably going to cast it on the same person. because, And I'm going to follow that up with two fireballs. Because otherwise, if I try to cast... If I've already cast haste on somebody, and we get to round two, which is right, luckily round two of three, and I cast Bigby's hand to try to restrain somebody, that might not work out. If they if I fail if they succeed on their saving throw against being restrained by Big Big B's hand, I have just wasted a spell slot. I've wasted my action, and on top of that, haste is now down for whoever it was on, which sucks now not just for you, but also for your teammate, and also for any teammates that would have been impacted by the actions of the teammate who was going to act as though they were under the influence of haste. So it's this compounding effect of extremely high-risk situations for little to no reward. Sometimes even not only no reward, but additional cost. It's it's a sucker's game, wherein, whereas I could have just cast Fireball and helped the team out that way, cleared out a few more goblins, decreased the boss's health. Those were your options. So they, their Band-Aid solution, based on 3X and trying to solve the problem of 3x ended up producing the exact same effect just with you doing far less interesting things and constantly punishing you any time that you went outside the bounds. Well, that's... Well, and that's punishment. the issue of concentration. Yeah. Um, and we should really get to the subclass hour because I have a Lancer game in half an hour. Um, yeah, let, yeah let's, co let's, uh, let's cover that. And f fortunately, because of how... A little too similar that this particular wizard is. Um, the whole issue of how the um, I'd say I'd say a lot of the subclasses are still are still going to still going to still going to fall in li in line more or less the same way. Um, so I'll start up. I'll start it. I'll start with the. I'll start with abjuration. Thumbs up, good mechanical fodder, and abjuration is naturally... While it might not be my cup of tea because it is passive, abjuration is focused on the expression of magical defenses. So anybody who goes with the abjuration wizard is probably hoping for their abilities to be more passive in nature, so thumbs up. It might not be my particular cup of tea, but anybody who... Like, that, that subclass has a very necessary place... In the in the pantheon mm -hmm. of wizard subclasses, if you will, mm -hmm. and it's they're not going to have any trouble porting that over. So thumbs up. All right, um, Artificer, or rather the UA version of Artificer. They made a UA uh, wizard <laughs> for Artificer. Yeah that that was that was when Eberron was a unearthed Arcana um, piece instead of instead of its own thing. 
I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna skip I'm gonna veto that one and skip it because Artificer is now its own class. Uh, I don't think that I think at most you would see that being mined for a different kind of wizard subclass. Perhaps. All right, blade singing. Blade singing. Oh, thumbs up, thumbs up. I have so much fun. Oh. I have, I have, I, I have so much fun. Uh, blade singer wizard was the first time that I had fun playing a wizard. Of course, it was multi-class with something, but that's as close to uh, a high number of wizard levels as I was going to get while simultaneously being entertained in fifth edition. Was blade singing is so much fun. You get to your primary class ability. You get two uses of it per short or long rest, rather than only one. Following a line with the druid's wild shape, which is brilliant because, like, if something gets screwed up and you don't, you don't just lose access to something that you really want to keep maintain access to. So it's a ton of fun, and uh, and yeah, yeah, just it's just thumbs up. It's a solid subclass on its own. They get they're gonna have plenty of mechanical fodder to make use of. On top of that, they have this huge maneuver system. Which like they could develop their own maneuvers for this individual subclass. No, nothing would stop them from doing it except for perhaps a cost benefit analysis. Maybe they decide that the active ones were enough, but that still makes the subclass cooler. Like there's nothing literally no downsides to including it inside this system. Thumbs up. All right. Conjuration. Conjuration, thumbs in the middle. Conjuration has a problem in 5th edition. Which that it, it, it's covering a lot. It, it's wearing many different hats at once. One is object summoning. I need it, I need an object, so I'm going to evoke it out of existence. Uh, or, or pull it into existence, or maybe pull it from somewhere else. Much like the various Chaos adherents of Nine Princes in Amber, or of the Amber Chronicles, who are able to basically seek through Shadow and say, all right, well, I need a beer, so I'm going to look, I'm going to pull through, I'm going to send my mind through the adjacent shadows and look for a beer, and I'm going to pull it into being in front of me. That's right, one experience kind of conversation. I'm going to find a powder that deflagrates like gunpowder does, but doesn't, but does it at home instead of in this earth shadow. There you go. There you go. <laughs> the pink jeweling powder that was the pink used in gunpowder. Powder. I remember oh, that. Shit, it exploded. Well, that might be useful. I'm going to keep that in mind. Um, Thank you, Corwin. I love you, man. You're cool. Everybody loves Corwin. Everybody loves Corwin. But, and then next up is the set of. I transport myself and others set of spells instead of magic. And after that, following that is I summon minions. Now, I, I summon extra planar creatures to do my bidding. These are three disparate mechanical expressions of the What's same that? narrative theme of I can call other things into being from where there wasn't any. And this is this is cool but it, it poses a problem for like okay if i want to include features which focus on summoning creatures i need to be able to summon creatures which means that the fifth edition spell list is woefully inadequate as is its action resolution system as is its combat structure as is its set of monster stat blocks and abilities anything that you, you can think of it's fifth edition was Intentionally designed to not be conducive to summoner classes, which is uh, stupid. They did the opposite of future proofing. They said, we're going to make it so that this expression of a mechanical art type sucks in advance. No, they just took this Final Fantasy X route. Stay away from the summoner! <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it, thumbs in the middle. Yeah is going to be my answer because it's many different concepts inside a single mechanical archetype which needs to be there is a, a an appropriate balance of which of those different conjuration elements gets focused on and you can't you have to be careful with how you interact with that and decide which get the most attention with the within the bounds of the subclass all right. Or you have to introduce, this is my final note on it, or you have to introduce 
a universal element where it's like, all right, you summon anything. Anytime you displace another creature, anytime you summon a creature or an object, you get these different benefits. Or this spread of benefits that you can, and you get to choose one. So that some of them are going to apply better to more certain spells than others. And it's never really... You need to make sure... This is my thesis statement. You need to make sure that none of those class features are getting wasted. If somebody casts the wrong kind of con conjuration spell. That's my answer. So right. you just... I guess the, the best band-aid there would just be to make sure that the class features uh, apply... Choose from this list of class features whenever you cast a conjuration spell. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, divination. Yep. Uh, divination thumbs down. Thumbs down because divination tends to suck depending <laughs> on the game that you're playing. Tends to be extraordinarily passive. Tends to not provide you with many advantages and the advantages that it does provide you in with especially the spectacular ones are so limited in number that you almost feel bad about using them, which is where you never want to be playing a character. I suck, except for the occasional time that I do something, and I feel bad about having done it. That is the, that is the worst sequence of thoughts and feelings and emotions that you could possibly go through when doing anything, really. But especially when playing a game for entertainment. You know, you know Ash... Cassandra felt the same way. Who's Cassandra? Cassandra, the the prophet in Greek legend who nobody believed. Oh yeah, yeah. Thus, divination prophecy. Cassandra. Damn it! Why did I have to explain the joke, monk? Because you said because if you said Cassandra of Troy, I probably would have caught it. Ah, uh, just the word Cassandra should be enough. Come on, you. Oh, I'm sorry. In context, when we're talking about divination, yes, it's true. It, it was close. I like I I knew that you were going somewhere, just not where you were going. Perhaps if I had access to some divination magic that had been appropriately uh, statted out, that would have been that would have been easier to go with. But that's but divination. You're asking, you're asking for divination magic that doesn't exist in five E. Right. Problem. Well, that's the issue. Is <laughs> divination has this problem where the DM does not know what's going to happen in the future. But that doesn't need to encompass the totality of divination magic. It could be based on probabilities. It could be based on making you you yourself make a prediction, and if it comes to pass, you get to do something cool. If your divination is accurate, you get to do something cool. Uh, somebody gets to take an action out of turn. Because they know in advance that the, the enemy is going to walk through that door and level their guns. So your fighter is going to be waiting by, and they're going to get to take a full turn before initiative is even rolled. You could do that element of divination magic, but nobody ever goes with that way. It's just like, oh, well, the DM asks the DM a question, and the DM gives you, is either going to tell you a bit about their world, or they're going to give you a yes-no vague answer. A yes-no maybe answer for your spell slot that you just bended, which might not actually turn out to be accurate in the future. Monk, his, uh, his, his proposal for the player making a, a uh, prediction and this causing changes within the flow of battle is asking for a Joseph Joestar. God damn it. <laughs> you know, I should have stopped you before you said that and gone, next you're going to say, God damn it. God damn it. See? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the thumbs down. It doesn't even really make for good mechanical fodder. All right, uh, they're gonna have to. They're gonna have to scrap. They're gonna have to scrap what's in the game at present and rebuild it from the ground up to make it even on par with the rest of their wizard as it stands. Which, as I stated, I'm not being mean about this. I just don't think it's particularly their best work, but it is good work. Okay, something had to be the ugly ducket. Uh, ugly duckling, which is a reference I hope everybody understands. I understand. Um, <laughs> uh -uh. No, so, next <laughs> is um, enchantment. Enchantment? 
Ooh, thumbs up. This is the rape school of D&D. No, it's not. The... <laughs> <laughs> no, people... Enchantment has this delightful, ugly side to it, which is, like, magically compelling other beings. Uh, and is is very... I don't know when that entered the discourse of of people. There was, like, this one-month period of people addressing the Enchantment School, as I did a few moments ago. And which which disturbed me greatly, but then I found out that there turns out there were just people at certain people at certain tables, which were just behaving very inappropriately for any context, but especially something that I'm yeah, ostensibly doing. Yeah, we David. usually call we usually call them that guy. Yeah, that guy. No, that guy. we're gonna leave it at that guy. Uh, but I'm actually gonna give Enchantment a thumbs up because and, and Zan, I'm gonna let you go in a moment. Uh, I'm gonna give Enchantment a thumbs up because it. I mean, it's just good mechanics by and large. You just get a bunch of cool stuff. If they're gonna need to adjust some things around so that you get to do more with Enchantment by and large, but it's a cool spell. There's there, there's cool school. There's a lot of cool spells in the Enchantment school. They need more spells. They're, they're somewhat lacking. There's a reason why in Lords of Brackets I combined Illusion and Enchantment into the School of Glamours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because there, there, there's so much overlap between them. And that could, I mean, Jesus, that could be a point of origin for their mechanical developments is, is focusing on how adjacent Enchantment and Illusion can be to other spell schools and, mm -hmm. and really zooming in on that. Uh, they're, they're interesting specialists. There's, uh, there's a lot to work with. They just It just needs to be given a small booth boost and i think these designers are more than capable of doing that so thumbs up yeah sorry Sam, was, you were saying something i was gonna say that the people who refer to enchantment as the rape school of D D are the same people who like to enjoy playing fatal jesus <laughs> <laughs> we, are not ro we are not rolling for anal circumference you can end up with a negative anal circumference if you roll the right stats which we are not doing <laughs> um, evocation. A uh, thumbs up. I mean, no I particular, can't... no particular reservations. I, I was gonna say I can't imagine evocation getting anything but a thumbs up, considering Blaster Wizard. And, and it's <sighs> yeah, and I don't, I don't even really like the narrative expression of Blaster Wizard in comparison to the Control Wizard, but I, but I do understand a la Vance. Uh, they did. They did kind of start out. It's like, all right, you have the thousand, the spell of a thousand falling stars, and the fact you could cast that was your control element. That was your problem solver right there. I have a spell called the spell of a thousand stars. What does it do? What do you think it does? Yeah, allow me to demonstrate. But you'll forget it. That's why it's written down in my spell book, asshole. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I only need. I can only cast one per day because I only need one per day. The only person who will be left is me. I'll make Good. sure. No one will notice if there's no one to notice how the wizard does stealth. Um, <laughs> so, is, uh, did I did I sell the thumbs wait, up yet? Of, wait a minute. Uh, are, are you are you impl are you implying that the wizard is best buds with the Eversor assassin? <laughs> Because <laughs> they both they both have the same policy. Uh, they both have the same policy of ste of stealth. Nobody can nobody can notice if nobody's left alive to notice. Also known yes, as yes, also known as the difference between the right way, the wrong way, and the House Steiner way, which is the wrong <laughs> way with just more assault mechs. <laughs> I if you haven't noticed, I I have been watching way too much of Black Pants Legion. No, never. <laughs> um, illusion. Thumbs down. Uh, Watsi is similarly terrible at designing illusion spells. There's no reason that illusions can't provo provoke specific reactions in the in their targets or witnesses. Especially even when being creative, there's no reason why the developers can't go in and say, "Listen, occasionally." Your players are going to produce 
an effect or are going to attempt to produce an effect from one spell, which is similar to another illusion spell that already exists. And in those cases, this is how you adjudicate the effects. You know, this is going to be a toned down version of the other spell, but you could get additional benefit that the other spell that you're sort of mimicking wouldn't normally grant you. Uh, here's how certain creatures react to illusion spells, right? Beasts aren't really fooled by illusion magic based on sight, but they're very much they're very sensitive to illusion magic, which is based on smell. And uh, it, there, there's all these different methods of adjudication and what could what I could be dismissive in regarding as basically DM advice, but in reality when it comes to something that should have a profound impact on the game and somebody who a master of the mind should have a profound impact on the game, they should be powerful within the context of their character and should be fantastical and cool. Um, things which are basically due diligence on the part of the designer are missing from the game. All right. So, um, regarding illusion, I'm, I've actually been reading a, a a really nice story where uh, one of the characters tells another character who's developing their powers within illusion specifically, "You shouldn't strive to make your illusion a fantasy. You should strive to make your illusion uh, as close to the person experiencing their own downfall as possible. That way." Even if they realize they're an illusion, they have but to experience their own downfall. Yeah, which which I like. I mean, there's so many things where it's like, why shouldn't illusions be able to produce the feeling of touch? I mean, is there's tactile no sensation not a sense? There's no reason. Um, I mean, there's no reason. I've right. never seen the, the the logic behind that either. Right, or I and should say the like, ill logic. So if your sword clangs, if your sword bounces off of an illusory wall in front of you, you'd be like, "Oh, well, I felt, I, I felt that, but I didn't hear it." And this could produce things like this could produce a different set of mechanics, and it, which illusion deserves sort of its own external set of mechanics for resolution but people don't like doing that i so i'm giving it a thumbs down it's like this is gonna if they want to make this work they have a lot of work ahead of them or they have to just take not necessarily uncreative but like the first more common tropes of illusions and just make them really powerful like inordinately powerful like all right well this this wall illusion also does damage, and it also makes people afraid, and, and whatever. Uh, they don't have a... I do not envy the de whoever has to tackle the School of Illusion mm -hmm. um, for this particular thing. I do wish them luck. Necromancy. And my resume. Um, necromancy. Thumbs up. Necromancy is pretty easy to express. I. This is another school in which I would... This is another school for which I would recommend when we're operating off the assumption that these different wizard archetypes are going to give you, by and large, especially if they're focused around the main schools, are going to provoke most of their effects when casting a spell from that particular school. So when I cast a necromancy spell, a, a, a spell of the school of necromancy, that's when I get to use this archetype feature. Right? As much as we were when we were discussing Conjuration. So... When it comes to necromancy, which also has a few different... Necromancy has a few different expressions of magic within its, within its overall theme, most of which center around life and death. But also the creation of undead is a really big one in there. And the creation of undead is perhaps unique in most views of magic as being inherently immoral and inherently evil. So, if I'm going to give a wizard of necromancy a few different abilities, which proc, based off of casting a spell of necromancy, this is another instance in which I would give them several different options to choose which one they were going to use when they cast the necromancy spell. All Which right. is also cool, because if you have the guy who's constantly animating undead, give him the option to animate undead when he casts Ray of Enfeebled in. That's cool. 
But for everybody who doesn't want to be the the sort of stereotypical necromancer who creates undead, uh, give them the option to do anything else when casting necromancy spells. Yeah. Now, next is the the last of the last of the basic schools, um, transmutation. Oh God! If only transmutation was actually cool. Um, fuck. I was so disappointed when I first played the Transmutation Wizard. I didn't really know what I was doing, of course, but like, also, it was just kind of a... I don't know, fuck. Uh, transmutation... I'm going to give... So, thumbs in the middle. There's a lot of cool spells, and you just need to be high enough level to access them, and it sounds like you're going to be able to access these spells more frequently thanks to things like Signature Spell and in, in this document. When it comes to the actual abilities, like, you're going to have to... There are two abilities that you could use as not fodder in the sense, like, you could use them as fodder for making abilities of your own. You can't copy and paste them into the level up transmutation wizard. I'm, I'm begging you, just take, maybe combine them together, make something way cooler out of them. It's like, there's all these weird passive benefits that you could sort of use, and get rid of for a little while if you really want to do something cool it's it, it, so watch you should spend far more time interacting with full metal alchemist when developing this transmutation wizard than looking at the current 5th edition transmutation wizard um, please funny you mention that because the the alchemist class in chronicles of heirs whose developer i had i had on for an interview a few months back He's outright admitted that Full Metal Alchemist was an influence. Well, of course. Um. And his it, although um, his approach is not ex is not exactly analogous to a to a wizard. He he put a lot of the alchemical effects in th in three different um, styles. I think those were um. Mercury, salt, and sulfur. Um, I see. Which is a pretty good spread, as far as I'm concerned. But but yeah, it's like don't the current fifth edition transmutation wizard is primarily uncreative slop, oh. which does not fulfill on the fantasy of what you would want to be as a transmutation wizard. So yeah. don't if you're going to pay attention to it, condense most of what is there into a single ability or maybe two abilities if you must. And the rest is going to have to be creative. Mm -hmm. Which I, I'm sure these devs can manage. These guys are pretty creative. Um, the, now that, bring, that brings that brings us to... Now, um, there, the wizard, unlike some of the other classes, the wizard has not, has not had as many subclasses outside of, outside of the basic eight. Um, we already mentioned the Bladesinger. The other, the second major major one that was introduced was the um, war mate was the war mage. So we'll go with that one next. Yeah. So the war mage is. I'm going to give it a thumbs up, and it's not because I think that the war mage, as it currently stands, is particularly amazing. It is effective at what it is built to do, by and large. Mostly thanks to the first ability that you get, which allows you to give yourself a bonus to armor class or a bonus to your saving throw by restricting your ability to cast spells the next turn, which I thought was pretty... I thought that was creative and clever. And it works fairly well. The theme, as far as, like, destructive power and potential, it, it ends up being a mostly defensive archetype, is the big problem. Rather than being, it's like, oh, well, I can, I, I'm not an evocation mage. I am, I am the school of artillery. And I know that both abjuration and evocation is most important to my particular line of work. Well, you end up just being a really defense, like a great defensive monster, but your offensive abilities are really like, oh, I get to expend a charge to deal damage equal to half my wizard level. And I only get one charge per short or long rest. And I have to cast like a counter magic to get the charge back. And it deals damage equal to half my wizard level, which means it's like three damage. Mm -hmm. 
it's crap. Yeah, that's the it's it's dog shit. Like, uh, so so all they need to do is not do that. They need to remember to check their numbers now, before they before they put it out, and I'm sure they'll do fine. There were um there were two traditions that were introduced in um, Wildemont that we ha- that we have to go over. Um, the first it? is the Chronergist. I have to confess, I have not looked at any of the... Uh, the only class Arctep that I'm familiar with from uh, Matt Colville's... Or, sorry, not Matt, Matt Mercer's book is the Echo Knight of the Fighter. Which and we already I, talked about. Which we already talked about. I, I am sadly not familiar with the classes in Wildemount. Alright, well... In that case, we'll skip the chronager. The chronager. It's basically what one controls time, one controls space. Is the is the general um, gist, um, narratively. Um, I'll say this: Matt is actually a really creative guy. Insofar as I was not expecting to, like he's more of a. When I say I wasn't expecting him to come out with like really creative designs, that's not me like slandering him or anything like that. I I have an impression of him as primarily being really creative when it comes to narrative. But he then took his affinity for narrative and said, oh yeah, I can also just totally express this in design as well. And Because mm-hmm. he's apparently just a polymath when it comes to RPGs, and good for him. Uh, uh, like, And good for everybody else, because we get to, we get to read the benefits, benefits of his creativity. As will the level up devs. So I'm going to give them, without knowing mm-hmm. the details of these sub- Classes. I'm going to give them both thumbs up because they were designed by Matt Mercer, and I have, from what I have seen thus far, I have great confidence in anything that anybody wanted to adapt from him. Yeah. Um. Now there's there are six um there are six entries in in uh, in Unearthed Arcana that I th- that I think are worth going over. The first is the Technomancer. The what? Technomancer. Te- Motherfucker, which book? Or which is this from? Te- this was Technomancy. This was Unearthed Arc. This was Unearthed Arcana. Modern Magic. Modern Magic. Oh, I I have no familiarity with that at all. So I'm going to veto. All right. All right. Um, Theurge. Ooh. Theurge. Uh, thumbs up. Actually, this was his. Th- <laughs> this was kind of funny. I I yeah. I don't have time to go into it necessarily, but um. The Theurge was interesting. It had a couple of neat abilities. There were some weird interactions with, like, you would just get certain cleric abilities before clerics would get their cleric abilities. Um, because that, those were really the only things. It It's a subclass based on any kind of subclass of a given class, which is based on cannibalizing the features of a different subclass, of a different class, is going to be tricky. But, in base 5e but with this document you have other features to take advantage of yep well you have like cleric exploration acts you have cleric social abilities you have you have cleric class features like there are all these different things that you could cannibalize and not have to worry about like well do we develop something that clerics don't have access to only this clericy wizard has access to which ends up being cooler than anything that the cleric has access to. That's that's really tricky to navigate. That's a really bad problem to make for yourself. I'm just going to say it. But with the class structure that these folks have developed, they could get away with cannibalizing other class structures. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't have an issue with it. So I'm going to give the Theurge a thumbs up. All, all right. Um, next is the... Onomancer. Oh, that was the fellow of names. It was basically yeah. their. It was basically their attempt to bring the true namer into Five E, which is interesting because the true namer back in the day was not well liked. <laughs> well, it's not the first time they've tried something like that. I'm going to give that thumbs in the middle. That was a weird. There's a bit of a weird concept. There's no reason why it couldn't be well done with the spread of abilities presented in these documents. Also, considering how 
how true name stuff always works in a thematic for, uh, form, you would get a lot of social and, and uh, narrative hooks from it. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I'm going to give it a thumbs up. The, it, it, to my knowledge, it has not been terribly well done before, so I must give it a thumbs in the middle because it would be quite easy to fall into the same ruts that were developed beforehand based on my under- my limited knowledge of the true neighbor which which I have gone over in the past and wanted to sort of wanted to investigate as a potential area of uh, of basically gameplay fodder mm-hmm. it's it's weird but weird does not mean bad and weird can often mean good especially in the context of classes which tend to do well with weird so i'm going to give it a thumbs in the middle and best of luck to, once again best of luck to any designer on the level up team who has to tackle that and also my resume <laughs> and lastly is the archivist lastly have we gotten to six already oh we have gotten to six already yeah because, no- yeah because one of them you skipped yeah, yeah, well, two of them I skipped, I guess. Three of them I skipped, realistically speaking. It's just that two of them I gave my endorsement uh, after skipping. Um, actually, actually, no, I, I take it back. There are there are two that we... There are two... Because we... There are two... That before, well, get to the archivist, but there's two that I ended up skipping. That's a derp on my part. So, I was about to say, because there there's one that I played, mm-hmm. and one which followed up the one that I played, which I definitely want to get to, because they were probably... Some of the cool stuff that Watsi's put out. Uh, what did you say, the archivist? Yeah. So I believe this turned into the Order of the Scribe in Tasha's, actually. And uh, I'm going to give it a, a vague thumbs up. This is one of those weird. I'm going to give it a thumbs in the middle. You're always going to have trouble with any kind of class. If it's not understood that your class can produce consumable items or consumable benefits, they don't necessarily have to be items, but using items as a proxy for most things which fall into consumable benefit that can be transferred from person to person or perhaps sold Mm -hmm. uh, is always tricky and is made trickier by systems in which not everybody can do that. You have to, you sort of have to go one way or the other. Either consumable items are things that can produce be produced by just about anybody, and often, provided circumstances align themselves correctly, or it's something that is not the is not the prerogative of class features at all. It's the prerogative of a purely circumstance. And to my understanding, the scribe was able to invoke a few consumable items, but also had abilities which were not focused on that at all. You had sort of like a living spell book that you that you could access, and that could be... Jeez, that could be fun. Mm-hmm. Why not? Uh, so, thumbs in the middle. It's a lot of mechanical fodder, a lot of narrative fodder, but I can see... I could easily see whoever works on that, works on translating that to the level up, look, being... just scratching their heads for an awfully long while. And thinking, where, where where the hell do I start? What the fuck do I do with this? <laughs> yeah. Um. Now the two that the two that I ended up skipping by accident. Um. One of the the first of those is the lore master. Indeed. Which is I do you want to? So uh, name the second one for me briefly. Um. The second one is. Um, wait, wait, Inven- School of Invention? Yeah, is that School it? of Invention. Okay, the, there's a reason I asked that. So I'm going to give you School of Invention first. School of Invention is getting a thumbs down because it was stupid, and it was an attempt to tone down the most interesting wizard subclass that Watsi has put out to date. Which is? Which is the Lore Master. The Lore Master was so much fun, I multiclassed it with her because at this point I had sworn off wizards. For everything, for mostly even mechanical fodder, I was disinterested in them. But then the lore master on a Thurkana came out, and I was like, oh, well, at the very least, I could multi class this with something interesting. And I did, and it was amazing. The lore master has a spread of abilities right at the beginning, which say, hey, you, sir, can consume, you can cannibalize spell slots to change the nature of your spells, you can change damage types. You so can alter the meta, range. It was meta magic then. 
It was kind of like meta magic, but in a weird, like in a different way. It was meta magic, but in a it, what it's, felt like a wizardy way. It skipped. It, it skipped. It, it, it's meta magic with less steps. It skipped the whole change a spell slot to sorcery points and just said spell slot meta magic. Right. Like if, if you expose, if you spent a probably the most important one was if you spent like a expend a third level slot, you could change the saving throw that composed your spell. It was like you were doing spell research on the fly, which is something that was, one, spell research is awesome, but two, there's like, I mean, hell, that's Merlin of Amber once he gets the, or Merlin of Chaos, depending on your point of view. Merlin of both would be a weird title. Both what would be the constant question, and I can see that getting annoying. Alternatively, you just go with the, with the best answer, Merlin, son of Corwin. Merlin, son of Corwin is pretty good. Um... Uh, yeah, Merlin, son of Corwin, once he gets the Spikered, which is this magic ring that allows him to do spell, re- spell research on the fly by tapping into many different sources of magic. But, point being, it was so much fun to describe why the Earthbind, which is a spell that allows you to reduce a flying creature's fly speed to zero, would be turned into a intelligence saving throw rather than a strength saving throw it was so much fun because everybody would be asking well how does it make sense for this one spell to be turned into this other saving throw it's like that's half the reason i'm playing this is so i could come up with that answer preferably in game because it's so much fun my answer would be instead of giving it gra- you know pulling it to the ground with gravity and that's why strength change my answer is i've made it too to remember how to fly mm-hmm. that was literally my my answer for it was i <laughs> lobotomized that i effectively lobotomized it i made it too stupid to fly guys <laughs> which was a de- god that was so much fun it was so much and the theme was this is why i say it's different from meta magic or felt different from meta magic i think on a subconscious level I was imagining that the spell slots that I was cannibalizing were other spells which shared the qualities that I was replacing the original spell with. I was replacing spell the strength saving throw with the intelligence saving throw of a phantasmal killer. Yeah, so spell augmentation then. Exactly, exactly. And it felt unique, it felt fascinating, it was the most fun that I've had playing any full caster in fifth edition and uh they it was too cool now it was too cool so people complained about it it did not reach the 70 percent uh approval threshold and there were a bunch of dms bitching about meta or metagaming it's like well because <laughs> appar- because apparently the logic nowadays is that the only person the only people who should be doing anything remotely meta magic e is the, um, no, not meta magic. Meta gaming. That was that was my mistake. Meta gaming was the was the problem. Was the idea like, well, um, you're assuming that the barbarian's going to be weaker to intelligence than strength, and therefore meta gaming. It's like, okay, okay. How's that? How's that? How's that? How's that meta gaming? How's that an assumption? Barbarians are known as illiterate savages in most settings. <laughs> What? It, well, that's that's sort of the problem. Is is once you get once this are once these different poisons make it into your industry, it's very hard to get rid of them. Which is why I'm just I personally am just seeking out an entirely different audience. I don't have to worry about people having bad experiences with fancy and casters. I don't have to worry about people having bad experiences with bad DMs or bad players or bad designs or or uh, whatever it is that or meta gaming and all these converse all these just. God, that was it was a subclass killed by the poisons of the industry that have so neatly condensed themselves within the fifth edition player base. And so I give it a hearty thumbs up because there's no way you could possibly screw it up. Unless you do exactly what they did. Oh you you say you say you say there's no there's no way that could be screwed up, but let's Let's not forget how well the how well the um the the psionics as a as a wizard subclass thing turned turned out the first time around. Well, that's because they were developed by Watsy. <laughs> and so there was no way they could do that without screwing up. 
<laughs> uh, sorry, not sorry, Watsy. I love that <laughs> answer. Yeah, but overall, I feel like I feel like when I when I look at the when I look at what they have for the level up wizard, this comes off to me like a first draft. Like it it oh with a with a lot of the with a, even. Even by the time a lot of the other casting classes and the other um, spe the other um, spell cast even the other spell casting classes that we had covered up to this point, by the by the time they're at tenth level, you can already see a bit of a narrative arc forming, with it forming within the um, within the features that they're getting. I feel like with a uh, with this level up five E wizard, they almost. Focused a little too heavily on mechanical hooks. Yeah, like there's a lot of mechanical things that are really cool mechanically, but they're missing a narrative element. And I think I think Galt's, I think it's I'm probably I'm probably going to end up dedicating a musing to this in the future. But there is a there is a bit of a problem with um, and this is not this. I want to make something clear. This is not. I'm not singling D and D out exclusively with this. It's just, but there is a bit of, but it is a bit of a contra. You're gonna end up having a contradiction when you make a when you make a jack of many trades type of class when class systems are built around specificity. That's why we got something as stupid as the factotum in a. Homebrew and and Ar Arcana. Yeah, it's it's the I'd say it's the I'd and I'd say it's also the reason why cl why classes like the my classes like the Ranger and Druid had a had a rocky start for the first few years. Mm -hmm. Um, now and well, rather the the Ranger and the uh, Bard, the Dru the Druid didn't didn't have that didn't have as much of a rocky start. In fact, it had the opposite. Um, but that's. But um, next week we will be covering. We will be covering a class that I've, ar I've already mentioned tonight, and will like. And will likely have to get into some of its unfortunate reputations over the years. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>